Hello, everyone, on site in Palo Alto Club. So glad to see uh, so many of you here and also online, uh, which uh, I hope will also be interesting and, and nice to, uh, to, to look at. So uh, I am super happy uh, to kick off this uh, new series, Masterclass series that we started this year. And uh, we started our cooperation with Finnish VCA. And, and that is why I'm very glad to welcome uh, Jussi Zainiemi here. Uh, he is a board member in Finnish, Finnish VCA as well as partner in Voima Ventures. And uh, without further ado, um, I think we can take questions uh, like all the time or you can sort of lead that. And those who are listening us online uh, can post their questions in the chat of, of the YouTube link. If for some reason it doesn't work, then please use the messenger of SVCA's uh, uh, Facebook page so we can get all the questions there. And uh, I am glad to welcome you, you see here. Yeah, thank you. So thank you so much, uh, Kadri and, uh, and Estonia and VCA for inviting me for this event. And this is very exciting. And, uh, and of course, I'm very much look, looking forward to making new connections and, uh, and sharing some experiences uh, I have uh, gathered during, uh, during the years. Uh, like Kadri mentioned, I, I would like to keep this sort of very interactive. I've prepared slides, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but I really hope that whatever questions you might have, please just address those and, and let's try to sort of discuss on the topics that you find the most interesting, not the ones I maybe have sort of uh, prepared something. Um, all right. But uh, so this is the sort of schedule for, for today. Uh, we have divided this session into the, uh, different, di uh, three different parts. And uh, <clears throat> first, I'm, I'm going to uh, focus on, on really sort of a little bit of basics of, of venture capital or, or private equity in general. And, and then sort of in, in more specific, specifically sort of focusing on, on what it requires to uh, establish a, a VC fund and, uh, and sort of related topics. Uh, then in the second part, uh, I'm going to discuss about um, uh, how, how we see typically evaluated sort of startups, uh, especially in the in the deep tech space. What are what are the sort of things that we we think are important, um, and 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 also then <coughs> um, how, what it's like to to work with with university or or science based startups and and how to how to sort of establish uh, uh, collaboration between uh, universities and VCs and, uh, and uh, so on. And then in the third part, uh, I'm, I'm going to have some company on stage. Uh, so uh, Mart and, and Vitali will be joining, joining me on, on, uh, on the stage and, and we'll discuss then a little bit about in, in a sort of broader uh, theme of how to create value out of, out of research. So let's get started. Uh, Maybe just a sort of short personal introduction. So um, my, my name was already mentioned. Uh, uh, I've been working in the technology related businesses for the uh, past 20 years. Um, I have graduated from Helsinki University of Technology and already before my graduation, I joined a local uh, consulting company called Pöyry. Uh, it's nowadays part of the Swedish Finnish uh, consulting uh, company, which is uh, stock listed called AFRI. And um, I did my master's there and, and, and then end up, ended up being all, all together nine years for, uh, uh, for working for Pöyry. And uh, of course, very sector specific consultant. We were mostly serving forest industry, energy industry and, and some other um, uh, sort of traditional uh, process industries. Um, then uh, in the beginning of, of 2012, I, I joined uh, Finnish Industry Investment, or, or you might know them as TESI as well. Um, it's a fully government-owned investment company in Finland. Uh, they are a big LP, but they also do have direct investment operations. Um, two, two different teams, and I was uh, working for the venture capital team the whole time as I was working, working with TESI. 
Um, <clears throat> the invest investment stage they have is A rounds and beyond, so they are sort of a little bit trying to fill the gap uh, in, the in the Finnish market space where most of the VC funds like Voima Ventures is really in the, in the early, uh, focusing on the early, early stages of, of companies. Um, due to my background, I was quite a lot working with industrial tech or deep tech related stuff. Um, uh, ended up making quite a few investments in, in that area, but also some other sort of more traditional like SaaS companies and software related businesses. Um, uh, and out, out of sort of those times, maybe the most successful companies uh, I was sort of leading the investment in the early days was uh, uh, was IceEye. I don't know, you might know this microsatellite uh, company. They already do have over 20 satellites in the orbit. And then Aura Health, maybe some of you might wear one as tracking, tracking uh, sleep and recovery. Um, then in, in the beginning of 2020, I joined Voima Ventures. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the partners and, and deputy managing partner of Voima Ventures. Um, and, and still my sort of focus area is a little bit to uh, follow this industrial tech space a little bit more thoroughly than my colleagues. But uh, we don't have sort of strict like silos that everybody's working with, but uh, looking uh, different kinds of companies and business verticals uh, uh, all the round sort of under the uh, deep tech theme on umbrella. Um, yeah, so that, that's pretty much my pro professional background. Uh, on top of that, I've, uh, I have family, my, I have five and two kids and, uh, and also a Corona dog. Uh, how many of, of this audience has a Corona dog? One, okay. That's, that's, I, I was, I was, I was, Quite sure that there's much more of those, but because I have a lot of, a lot of friends and colleagues who, who also ha had a, have a corona dog, so, okay. But you've sur survived uh, easy, much easier than, than we did. All right, so uh, a few words about Voima Ventures. So um, we are managing two different funds. Our origin, in, origin comes from VTT, a Finnish uh, research, National Research Institute, that used to have investment operation uh, investing only companies spinning out of out of VTT. Um, they decided to discontinue the operation, and uh, and uh, nowadays we are managing the portfolio they created on behalf of VTT, uh, mostly focusing on value creation and and, and getting pre uh, prepared for exits. Then at the same time, when we took over the VTT Ventures portfolio, uh, we raised our, our second fund, uh, so, so fund number two. Uh, it's a 45 million euro fund, uh, and the theme is, is sort of continuing what VTT used to have, or VTT Ventures, uh, really focusing on, on this deep tech uh, space in general. Uh, very early stages uh, from pre-seed uh, up to smallest A round, around, uh, mostly focusing in, in, in seed stages. Uh, as an initial uh, investment. Um, so far we've conducted approximately 20 investments uh, or, or, or have uh, done 20 inv investments out of the second fund and uh, still pl planning to make a couple of more before then closing the investment period. We're currently also raising our, our next fund. Um, and uh, sort of in terms of the number of investments the biggest number in terms of the themes is, is uh, life sciences, so both biotech and, and, uh, and, uh, and medtech. I think we have currently seven investments out of 20. Um, but then we have wide range of, of different kinds of areas like uh, quantum computing and uh, space technologies, uh, weather technologies, uh, semiconducting sensors, uh, uh, sustainable tech uh, and new materials and so on. So uh, quite a Deep tech eats in a lot of stuff. Uh, our focus is really sort of uh, scaling solutions for people, planet, and industry. So, so we are impact-driven fund, and, and that will be even, even sort of more precisely than defined in our, in our new fund. But uh, mo most of our investments can be, uh, are addressing either sort of uh, planet-positive related uh, area or, or then this uh, uh, societal well-being related uh, re related area. So uh, uh, it's not only about the financial returns, it's also about um, making good for, for the society. Um, yeah, we are currently 13, uh, uh, 13 employees, uh, uh, 
most of us are in Helsinki, but in, uh, during this tr spring we opened up our offices in, uh, in Sweden, so we have two persons in Stockholm, one full-time and, and another one uh, uh, partially working for us. And uh, we try to be active also in the Baltic countries, obviously Estonia being the most important one of those. Um, uh, we don't have anyone currently here uh, full-time, or but uh, we're sort of regularly uh, visiting here as well. Good, so that's the intro. Um, then if uh, moving towards the actual, actual topics, and uh, just sort of give a flavor. I don't know how many of you have or previous experiences from sort of venture capital or investing or, or so for how many this is sort of very familiar. Okay, so maybe 50-50. So some of you are not that familiar, so maybe it makes sense to say a few words also about what kinds of, of sort of uh, fund models and strategies there, there are in, in very, er, very sort of uh, high, high level. Uh, venture capital as such is, is uh, basically uh, all the venture capital funds are typically investing in companies uh, having very sort of strong technical uh, competitive advantage. It could be anything but that's, it's a technology sort of investments. Very, very rarely it's, uh, it's about the services or, or, or similar. Um, it's always companies by definition, which are cash flow negative. If it's cash flow, flow uh, positive or, or even neutral, it's typically then considered more like growth investments. Venture capital is cash flow negative companies. So really uh, investing for the, so for, the, for the future growth. Um, typically, or, or basically always, it's a minority investment. So, so uh, when we make an investment, we're typically owning in the beginning we aim to be around 15% uh, plus minus. Uh, so of course we cannot we cannot call the shots uh, ourselves. There are I'm going to discuss a little bit about uh, uh, the agreements later on today. But uh, uh, but of course we don't typically have rights to make any decisions, bigger decisions by ourselves. We need to have consortium and uh, and uh, and and uh, we need to collaborate a lot with with the founders or or with other investors in. Uh, in the company, and uh, and of course, there's a huge scale of of different kinds of funds. It could be like us focusing on early stages, and then there are these humangos funds, uh, which can invest hundreds of millions in in the companies, like in the in the in the Bay Area. The growth capital is is then another form of 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 uh, growth investing, um, but maybe the change or the, the difference is that. In, in growth stage, companies have already or are closing to the cash flow neutrality and, and, and sort of the risk position is, is completely different than in, in venture capital. But the, it's a little bit of a fine line some, sometimes. Um, maybe the flexibility also in regards to business models is a bit, uh, a bit higher than, than in venture capital. Um, then buyout, that's a sort of completely again, sort of different kind of a strategy, uh, as you know. They try to have maturity of the companies. They call the, call the shots. Uh, they they can get them their own persons in the board. They can decide everything by themselves. They typically take some sort of uh, own guys, so to say, also to the management of of, of the company. And and then there are these uh, sort of uh, mezzanine and, and and venture debt providers who are a little bit in between. So so they are not like traditional banks. Uh, they also do have these, these equity kickers in their, in their strategy. Uh, but there's also the interest part. Um, and, uh, and compared to these uh, sort of pure uh, uh, equity investors, uh, their investment strategy is typically much more passive. So they are rarely having board seats or, or anything like that. Um, then what, what, what does it mean sort of uh, to be uh, in in uh, in venture capital fund and how we work. So uh, typically, the life cycle of a fund is, is uh, five years of the investment period, making new new investments, and then the additional five years for for making follow-on in investments and, and really getting the exits done, value creation uh, value creation and exits. Um, during that time, uh, 
we, we meet thousands of, of, of teams and, and then we try to select, depending on the strategy, we invest approximately 25 companies out of each fund. So uh, some VCs might, might make more, lots more investments and, uh, and some even, even fewer than us, but, uh, but still, so uh, in terms of the hit rate of, of the teams met, it's a very small portion of, of the teams that are then, then sort of uh, suitable for our investment str strategy uh, or, or we feel that there is the potential. This is a people business. So uh, as, as you know, who have been uh, working in a startup or on investor side, uh, the collaboration between uh, the investor and, and, the, and the team is very close. And, and it needs to it needs to work. The chemistry is very important. So, so uh, if you feel during the time that we're you're kind of dating the company that the chemistry isn't working, it's better to then focus something else because uh, it's not going to get any easier during the life cycle of seven years. And there's going to be hard times uh, then then uh, during during uh, that time period. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's about value creation. It's about the sort of giving the framework for the company, giving the focus, uh, opening up the networks and, and all of that. And uh, the, the VC sort of uh, return math is, is sort of, it's, it's cruel. It's typically out of these 25 investments we do, we could approximately say that maybe 40% are, are sort of returning nothing. Then maybe uh, 20 to 30 percent are, are returning uh, approximately the, the uh, investment we have done back, and, and then the, the last sort of uh, 10 percent of the investments, hopefully a bit more, are really sort of uh, covering all the costs that we, we have lost making these uh, these zeros, and, and uh, then but providing all the all the return for the fund. So so that's that's how it works. Um, and as I said, please, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to, to sort of uh, uh, raise your hand or, or just uh, cut in. Uh, a different kind of, so what are the roles of, of a venture capital fund? Um, so, of course, partners are the ones uh, who are kind of on the top and uh, having the overall responsibility of the fund, how it, or how it organizes its work and, uh, and who is doing what. And, and of course, they are also most re sort of accountable towards the LPs of the fund. Um, <clears throat> and, and also in the fundraising uh, stages, it's typically that the, the partners are the ones really sort of uh, driving the, the fundraising process. And, and, uh, and also that, that is, is sort of with LPs, it's, uh, uh, it, it's people's business so that the chemi chemistry needs to work. Um, Maybe I don't. I don't going to read read through all of this of what I've what I've stated here, but um, uh, just to give you a flavor. So, um, so basically, partners are are doing almost or participating in almost all kinds of activities the funds have. Uh, then venture partner models. I, I I think that there are different kinds of models, uh, but the one we are using is really that uh, it is a very let's say lean way to add the number of senior staff in the fund. Uh, without sort of significantly expanding the cost structure of a fund. So we, we for instance, we have four uh, 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 venture partners. Out of the 13 persons, we are all together. And uh, they are working for us uh, part-time, uh, maybe a couple of days a week. And uh, each of our venture partners have sort of very strong background in a certain business vertical. They have ability to source deal flow that we likely wouldn't see otherwise. They have a very good connections there. And on, th on the other hand, they are also very good at evaluating the cases, uh, whether, whether they are worth investing or not. Of course, uh, we pay, pay them sort of a, a monthly retainer, which is uh, quite modest. But in return, what they get from us is that they can use our sort of analyst resources. We also uh, open up our uh, deal flow towards them. Um, and, and, and they can, of course, then invest their own, own capital uh, together with us and, uh, and in, in that way most likely get better deal terms that they would get uh, investing by themselves. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that there are different kinds of, of uh, venture partner models depending on the fund, so this is like not 
something which is uh, quite flexible, even though the, or the title is the same. Then in investment directors, uh, they typically uh, are, are quite already seasoned uh, investment professionals. Uh, they are leading, uh, leading the investment rounds, leading the deal teams, sourcing deal flow, actively sort of building the, uh, the brand of, of the fund and, and, and participating in different kinds of events and, and all of that. But on the other hand, of course, very actively also participating in the portfolio work, uh, sitting in the boards of our portfolio companies and, uh, and, and then driving value uh, uh, through that work. Um, investment managers, I, I think in general the, the scope of the work is pretty much the same than with directors, uh, but uh, typically they are having a little, little less, um, little less uh, previous experiences and, uh, and, and uh <coughs> maybe a little bit then, then less uh, responsibilities in the fund, but uh, in, in general I, I think that the overall scope is pretty, pretty much the same for both. Then analysts are, are typically persons who are really helping and supporting the team in, in analyzing the cases. In our fund, we are typically also use, uh, making these um, like deep dives into certain industrial or business verticals in order to understand more, in order to be able to really identify proactively what is needed in a, in a certain business vertical uh, in the future and, and then try to identify companies who are tackling the challenge, uh, because then we, we believe that that way, that way uh, uh, we, can, we can find sort of pearls uh, which might not be evident for, for everybody. Uh, then, then, of course, we have a lot of different kinds of uh, softwares and tools, and, 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 uh, and, and these, these persons are then, then uh, maintaining those, and, uh, and also they are in charge of, of sort of the deal flow funnel and, uh, and all of that. Uh, then on, on top of, of these, these roles, so of there, there are CFO, quite, quite typically in the fund, um, sort of responsible for reporting related stuff and admin and, uh, and, and financial planning. Uh, then marketing person and uh, then this, uh, we don't have entrepreneur in residence, EI, uh, EIR. Uh, some funds do. Um, it's a role where typically very experienced like startup CEOs want to sort of change uh, to the fund side, and uh, then they, they are taking these uh, temporary positions in in uh, uh, in funds uh, or um, in, in portfolio companies to help those to get over a certain certain sort of uh, stage. Then a little bit about sort of suitable backgrounds uh, in in for for these different roles. Um, Partners typically, it's uh, well. Most of the partners have quite a sort of extensive experience uh, in this uh, VC industry prior joining uh, joining as a partner or pr prior becoming a partner. Maybe the exceptions are that if there are really successful entrepreneurs, even serial entrepreneurs, uh, having a very strong um, also exit track record. Those could be also profiles that are sort of immedi immediately taking the partner position, even though they wouldn't have that significant um, previous investment e experience. Uh, then, as I said about venture partners, typically they are heavily focusing on certain area, have a long experience from operational roles uh, from that business sector they are they are responsible for. Um, investment directors. Um, Many cases, they also do have at least five years of experience in, in, uh, in the investment uh, teams, uh, whether it's an, another fund or, or, or something similar, or, or being sort of an angel investor. That's also quite good merit if you have a strong track record there. Uh, investment managers not necessarily have that much of previous investment experience. Quite typical route is, is uh, from consulting or, or from sort of MTA advisory. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of useful skills which can then be applied also in, the, in, in this uh, investment man manager role. And then in analyst, of course, uh, very different kinds of routes for, for, uh, to become an ana analyst. I think many funds like, like us, uh, we are having this intern program. We, we have uh, 
an intern all the time. It's a, typically a 12-month period that they are working for us. And, uh, and uh, currently, our, our only investment analyst is some, someone who originally joined as an intern and, uh, and was this year then uh, uh, nominated to investment analyst. All right, maybe b before moving to, to this uh, LP relationships building, uh, any, any questions on, on the roles or, or sort of general stuff related to VC funds or... Uh, Yeah, yeah. There are a li little bit sort of also like in uh, in consulting business, there are different titles for for similar sort of uh, responsibilities. So somewhere uh, in some funds they are called associates, and and another funds they are called uh, uh, analysts uh, or senior associate could be like an investment manager in another fund. So they're pretty similar, but the different terms. Um, all right. Um, then, if moving forward to uh, to this uh, limited partner relationship building, and uh, what is sort of, uh, in my opinion, imp important or or helpful, if if you are sort of planning to to build a fund of your own. By the way, is, is there anybody who's currently actively like in process of uh, of trying to raise a fund or or planning to do that? Okay, good. I have a couple of couple of persons. Great. Um, so I, I think uh, in in general, sort of, uh, it's it's like uh, the VC in is uh, building the funnel of of deal flow funnel and and uh, sort of the number of uh, potential startups needs to be high enough in order to then identify the the most sort of interesting ones there. I think it's the same with uh, when when fundraising that you need to have sort of uh, enough volume. O of course, uh, it's good to understand that there might be certain certain uh, investors that you know quite easily that uh, doing a little bit of, of sort of research that they are not likely interested in your, your investment strategy. So no, no sort of uh, uh, worth, worth using time for those, but, uh, but in general, so, so have long enough list and uh, Obviously, uh, the LPs are having tons of requests from different teams, different funds, whether they are sort of existing or, or emerging. And um, so, so they, there is a sort of, uh, they, th these guys are very crowded. So the best way to have bandwidth from, from a potential LP is really through an intro. So if there is a sort of common business partner you know, ask, ask for intro. That, that helps a lot. Cold calling, much more difficult. Then maybe another point I would like to address is really this, it's a, it's a long-term play, uh, building relationships with, with, with LPs. So uh, it's, if you think that the LP as such, uh, you are you're sort of, a, uh, in terms of strategy, you are a good fit for them. Uh, even if they, they wouldn't invest in your current fund, it's good to keep up the relationship because they might be interested in them becoming an, an LP in, in your next fund. And, uh, and, and LPs are typically following a long time the teams, how they develop, how th how, what kind of progress they have before making the, uh, uh, the um, decision whether they are in or out. So you need to nurture that. And, and also it's quite typical that funds are sort of doing fundraising only when they are just about to raise the fund. But in, in practice, it would be more beneficial to keep up the relationships also between the funds. So long-term play. Uh, then be resili resilient. Um, most of the LPs will say no. It's, a, it's part of the business. It's like I just said that uh, we are meeting thousands of teams, investing in 25 companies. 99 out of 100 times we're saying no. So it, it's, the, it's the name of the game, but you don't, don't get depressed. Uh, it doesn't mean that you are, you are poor or, or you're, you're not a fit. You just need to find the, the suitable partners and, and sort of work more. Um, 
And in any case, even though it might be no now, it could be yes in the next one. So now you're on the radar. And, uh, and for, for that point, uh, always go back with the good news. So whatever the sort of you have achieved, whether it's small or, or tiny thing, it's good to keep the investors sort of interested by, by going back and telling, hey, how are you? Now, now we've achieved this, uh, we're progressing nicely, and, uh, and, and then would you like to have a cup of coffee or something in the, in the coming weeks? So uh, those are maybe my takes on, on, on how to get started with, uh, uh, with the rela relationship building uh, with LPs. Mm, please. Sure. The mic because the others uh, exactly. online yeah. won't listen here. So, uh, when you first joined Voima, mm -hmm. were you also uh, in the process of fundraising? Did you see it then and you see it now? So, what would be the sort of main things you see that Voima has imp like changed, improved uh, throughout the years, knowing that you know yeah. we need to do that better for for for, for you know be more impressive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, good question. Um, uh, I wasn't part of the team in Voima when the first one, first fund was, when uh, the first closing was, was done. I, I joined only uh, six months uh, after that, but I was uh, present in the second closing or the final closing, so, and, and part of the fundraising team back then. And uh, the general sort of uh, change between now and then is really that uh, back then Voima was an emerging team. It was, even though we had the first fund from VTT, uh, we didn't have the track record, but now we do have a track record, and, and it really makes a difference. So it's much easier to get the doors open when, when you are already sort of an existing team, and, and, you, and you can show that this is what we have been doing, and, uh, and we're actually con mostly continuing doing the same, and, uh, and so it is much easier than, so being an being, being a emerging team is, is challenging, but uh, you need to so start from somewhere. It's, uh, it's a fact of, of, of this business. So what are the things that the LPs are looking after uh, uh, from a fund? So, of course, uh, it's very important that, that the key team members have previous experience uh, working in the field that they are now building the strategy towards. Um, whether it's... Uh, and, and, and that is really, really due to that, that you need to be able to show that you have an access to interesting deal flow, most likely something that no one else have the same access. Um, and, uh, and also that um, you, you know how to, how, how to build businesses in the specific area. But also the, the networks, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is really about the sort of having the networks and finding the suitable talent and suitable team members and, uh, and all of that. So, so that is very important. Then the track record, as I just mentioned, uh, um, you need to be able to show, or at least part of the key members of the team need to be able to show sort of strong track record that they have been um, successful in identifying the cases uh, which have then turned out to be sort of uh, successful. Um, it doesn't mean that if there's like four partners in the team, not necessarily everybody needs to have the same background or similar sort of uh, track record. It could be that part of the partner teams are then maybe having this uh, background of, of being successful entrepreneurs. The strategy is very important. So, so um, what is the focus? And, uh, and, and why, and, uh, and really the, um, the stage you are investing in and, uh, and, uh, and the business verticals, business models, and, and all of that. So each LP will ask, uh, what are you going to, in, what, in which companies are you going to invest, in which area, whether it's a geographical area or, or business area. Uh, the diverse team structure is also important, uh, that there are balance of different kinds of previous experiences, uh, but also um, it's very important to have sort of also different age structures in the team, that not everybody are sort of mid-age men is the, is the worst, so uh, 
Uh, so, so for instance, in our our team, uh, we have 13 persons and six are women and seven are men. So we are quite well balanced. <coughs> um, and then the the approach. I already a little bit discussed about that, but. Uh, but of course, LPs, as, as I said, they, they are seeing so, so many sort of different GPs. They have a lot of opportunities they can select from. So why would they select you and your strategy rather than someone else who is probably active also in the same space or might have been active in the same space for, for, for a long time already and having a strong track record? So it's also sort of worth paying attention and making a little bit market research on, on really sort of uh, f finding the area where there isn't too much of competition. Obviously, if it's something that no one else is there, then it might might be questioned: uh, if, is there a sort of enough free deal flow or on all of all of that? So, what does Voimaster when LPs ask that? The unique approach. I mean, what what are the things you yeah. say, for example? Yeah, sure. So, so. Uh, we are the only or the first um, VC fund in, in the Nordics uh, who focused purely on deep tech in, in early stages. So, th for instance, in Finland, there are funds like Lifeline Ventures or, or Maki VC who are also using a part of their allocation to, to, to the deep tech space. And, but we are the only one focusing only on that. And, and there are sort of benefits coming out of that. We have a lot of networks which are sort of especially focusing on this area and, and we have a lot of university contacts and all of that. i come come back to those later. Good. So um, um, then about sort of considerations of um, what is really sort of when establishing a deep tech fund and, and the sort of considerations which might not be relevant for, for other, other sort of funds. But the first question which always is asked, uh, for, for instance, from us, is that everybody's sort of um, mindset is that, yeah, you are working with hard, hardware-related stuff. Is it that take a lot of time and a lot of capital and all of that? Yeah. So, so you need to be prepared. What is your answer? How do you sort of tackle the sort of, uh, I, I don't know, with h how would you say that, the, but the, some kind of an old wisdom that hardware is, is, hardware is difficult, most of the VCs have been sort of avoiding hardware-related investments. Uh, I, I think uh, almost <laughs> always. So, uh, so you, you need to find the answers, and, and, and you need to be able to sort of uh, be convincing why you think that, with your experience and your contacts and all of that, you can actually uh, and then shorten the, uh, the time uh, time frame. Um, then the other part relates to the team building. So um, I, I will sort of come back to the, the definition of deep tech later on. But uh, but of course, as as you all understand, that deep tech as such is a like an umbrella theme, and and uh, it can be found anywhere. So you, no one can build a team which can then credibly say that yeah, we know all the business model, we know all the sort of uh, business verticals and, and, and have a deep understanding whatever sort of uh, technical challenge uh, a startup is trying to overcome. Uh, so, so you need to be careful how you build your team in a way that you have enough sort of core competencies inside the team that you can probably then, then cover, let's say, 70% of the cases you see uh, quite well with your your own team. Of course, then then when doing a deeper DD, you might be still wanting to use outside sort of ad advice for some technical uh, details. But but still, that you can say whether this is a big thing or not. And and then uh, for the for the balance for the thirty percent or 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 uh, what have you is uh, you have sort of expert networks that you can then apply and uh, and, and use those. Leverage that network for, for evaluating the cases. And uh, then the third consideration is this impact. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, that we are really uh, more and more towards also measuring the impact. 
um, and many of the sort of significant uh, institutional investors are sort of requiring that that deep tech funds should be able to provide impact, not only financial returns. Uh, and uh, I, that is fully aligned with our investment strategy, so that's not a, not a problem for us. And, uh, and, and there's actually nowadays, it used to be maybe seven years ago, uh, that basically impact funds were considered okay, so, so you're providing impact because you're not providing any returns. But nowadays it's actually that you, you can do the both and uh, the latest EIF statistics so that uh, their best per performing funds are actually also impact funds. But yeah, so uh, be prepared for, for building that sort of frame for framework for, for impact and, and measure that and also that some of the uh, uh, LPs might actually require that part of your, your carried interest is, is also, also subject to uh, fulfilling the KPI criteria. All right, so um, this might be sort of familiar for, for all of, or many of you, but uh, this is just an sort of example on, on the value growth or, or value creation. So when we typically, we make our first investment in the seed stage, it could be pre-seed when the company is just being established, or like in, in this, this example, uh, th this would be like the, the follow-on case, assuming that the company has, uh, raised some money from, from typically their f friends, family and other fools uh, before, before this round. So uh, with the first, first sort of uh, round, you really try to uh, make the focus for your company, that, that everybody's aligned what we are trying to achieve and, and how the market looks like and uh, as soon as possible sort of try to uh, uh, or, or begin the, the discussions with potential uh, commercial partners or, or, or future customers in order to validate the need and, and, and somehow sort of validate the product market fit. That is one of the most typical st struggles that the startups have, that, that they just don't have the product market fit even though they think that they do have that. Uh, then the roadmap and, and sort of uh, milestones in between really before the next funding round, which is then typically the, the A round. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and then under the current market circumstances, actually the requirements towards uh, A rounds have been in increasing quite a lot. So, so maybe a year, uh, year, year ago or a year and a half ago, you could, you could uh, raise A rounds without having sort of that solid traction if, if your sort of plan was good enough. Uh, but nowadays, uh, a, a round investors are re really requiring that you have already sort of, uh, you need to have something to show, uh, you need to have paying customers or, or, or partners that, that can validate that, uh, that uh, the growth is there. Um, but yeah, then, then uh, with, with this capital, of course, hopefully then, then the commercial stage is already, already sort of uh, uh, started and, and, and then being expanded and uh, depending on the company, of course, there, there could be different kinds of, of al alternatives how, how the money is being spent. Um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll skip this one. This is quite sort of uh, quite um, general stuff, but then coming back to how to sort of build the investment strategy uh, by stage, that's also very important when you are building the, the fund strategy, that the investors understand what are the sort of areas where, where, you, where your capital is going to be a, addressed and uh, what stages of the company. And, uh, and, and then many, many uh, funds nowadays do have quite broad uh, spectrum of, of stages they are, they are addressing. But this is how, how we do it. So, so as I said in the beginning, uh, our, our sort of uh, sweet spot is really the, uh, the early stages. So pre-seed and seed and, 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 and then late seed. And very selectively we can do smallish A rounds, but then, then again it's a question of how we define whether it's late seed or smallish series A. There's no, there's no rules for that. Uh, but our, out of the 25 investments we do from our fund, 
approximately 15 to 20 companies are, are in these uh, uh, different seed stages, and, and then five to seven companies are, are then during the time of the initial investments uh, uh, is then, then in, in uh, big seed or, or, or smallest series A. Um, and in practice, many of funds, including us, who are focusing in this stage, is, it is approximately that one third of, of the capital commitments in the fund are, are, are uh, used in the initial investment rounds, and two thirds are, are then uh, address, addressing the follow-on investment rounds. And obviously, those follow-on follow investment rounds are not sort of demographic, democratically sort of uh, distributed uh, among, the, um, among the portfolio, but of course we want to back the companies which are performing the best, the most, and, and then the ones which are not making any progress as little as possible. Right, and uh, then like the sort of th the value creation, as I have been mentioning that uh, sort of term for many times, it's uh, it's it's sort of uh, there. There's a, uh, it's it's, a, it's sort of a recurring term, and uh, and each fund try to have their own way how they build or create value in in the portfolio companies they have invested in. And our sort of uh, uh, three like major topics are, are listed here. And, uh, and getting their team right is, is the first part. And uh, that is, as we do a lot of collaboration with, with this university, sort of research uh, originated companies, it's many times that we need to use a lot of work for, for First of all, getting them to understand that they're actually they are missing some capabilities and skill sets from the team, so that there's no one in the team who has been selling anything sort of in, in, in their earlier lives. So, so that's 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 the first part. Then the the, the second part is sort of getting this strategy and uh, and a focus in place. Um, it's quite common that. Uh, uh, especially in the deep tech space, that uh, the innovation is, is sort of capable of, of doing all kinds of stuff. Um, everything is basically possible, but you need to be able to show that you are good at something before you can then expand to other, other sort of opportunities. And uh, if you don't do that, then you are likely not going to get any traction on, on any of this, this, uh, these areas. So really getting the focus and, and having very concrete milestones, what needs to be achieved by when, and, and then it's about sort of uh, following up uh, that uh, those things are, are actually happening. Um, and, and of course, you don't need to be too stubborn on, on then sort of if, if you now, in the beginning of, of the investment, you are sort of uh, uh, writing down the business plan and, and agreeing on the targets. Of course, you need to be mindful that uh, if new evidence comes along, which is sort of uh, showing that actually your st strategy is not working, then you need to pivot. And uh, it's a fine line whether you, you sort of, uh, when is the uh, sort of right time for, for pivoting, because of course, you need to be able to give enough time for the team to, to show that, that the um, selected strategy is working. But then if, if there's no evidence sort of supporting that, then, then you need to sort of find uh, other ways to, to do, the, do the thing or, or focus on, on, on something else. Uh, and then the third part of, of this sort of value creation uh, that we think we can bring a lot of value actually comes down to this uh, deep tech focus. So, so uh, we consider ourselves as a platform and, uh, uh, and that pl platform sort of, we have a lot of connections. We have now 33 portfolio companies. And uh, in, in those companies, there's a lot of investors, obviously, who are active in this, uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, deep tech space. Uh, but not only as an investors, but also they could be, they could be sort of these uh, corporate VCs who also seek for other ways for collaboration. And, uh, 
they could be also customers. Um, so we are able to leverage that, that network we have uh, for the benefit of, of our, our portfolio companies. Then doing a lot of work with universities, of course, they are also an important, important uh, counterparty for us. So, so we know the professors, we know the, uh, the advisors and experts in those, uh, those universities and, and, and research institutes and uh, can help them to evaluate the cases, can help them to uh, really attract suitable talent or, or identify suitable talent, which is, of course, there's a fierce sort of uh, competition on, on the best talent, as, as we all know. And then the third part is obviously the more sort of traditional VCs that are active in this area where, where we have a lot of connections as well. So it's, we can help the teams then if, if they're able to succeed in the plan and, and deliver what, what has been agreed, we are able to then also help them in fundraising the next round, and, uh, uh, which is obviously uh, then a big milestone as well. Yes, please. Um, question about actually the team side. So how often do you see the deep tech or science-based teams being only science-based uh, and not having this business part too well covered? So do you have a secret sauce uh, with those teams? Do you have, I don't know, CEOs in your back pocket to like help them out or what mm. do you do with those? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question and, and uh, we'll actually come back to that in the, in the later sessions today. Um, the challenge, of, of course, we have a networks. The challenge is that, uh, as, as, we, as we know, that uh, it's quite dynamic pool of, of people that they might be available today, but they might not be available tomorrow. So, um, but what we do, of course, we leverage our networks, but we, we do help then, then these research groups to, to identify suitable talent and of course there needs to be the chemistry again as, as discussed but I, I think it's the first screen is that there might be research teams uh, who are planning to spin out the company but they don't agree on, on having additional sort of uh, f founding team members they, they think that they already do have everything and then it's uh, easier for us to say that okay good luck that's not for us but um, no point of, of, of using time then. So, of course, that's also, as I said, it's the first screen. But I have yeah, also one question. question. No. Um, you mentioned that the part of your time goes to coaching founders. Can you give some tips like when it is working and when it's not working and what is the type of coaching that is effective from your time? Um, yeah, that's also a very, very, very important topic. Um, very difficult to give any, any sort of uh, answer which is a one-size-fits-all kind of an answer. Uh, different, different CEOs have uh, different challenges and uh, depending on, on the challenge, of course, then, then, then we try to find a way which is the, the best then, then sort of uh, uh, supporting the development of, 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 of the specific CEO then. So, um, but I, I think um, it's many times related to team building related stuff, uh, especially when the companies, if they are successful and the team size keeps growing very rapidly, there might be, might be coming then challenges on, on how to manage the team actually and, uh, and, and how to create the culture in the team so that, uh, that people are, are willing to work for the company in the long term. So those could be challenges. Then the other sort of a typical, let's say, crisis is if in, in, in cases where the company is not sort of successful and uh, even though the plans could have been built sort of decently and, uh, and everybody have, ha have been sort of believing in those, it can turn out to be that uh, it just doesn't work out. And then the CEOs might be very sort of feeling alone that what now? And, and then of course we try to help them to uh, to discover new opportunities, new ways to, to achieve the targets and uh, maybe find, find then outside, outside uh, uh, support for that as well. Um, but also in some cases it is just that, that the CEOs doesn't scale themselves and, and then, then it's sort of also our, our responsibility to have the discussion with the CEO that maybe 
your profile actually could be more kind of a like CTO profile and maybe we'll need to find someone else to take the CEO a position uh, and uh, and focus then also the team building and, uh, and and the culture creation and all of that but yeah very important topic about <coughs> sorry about the networking uh, are you also collaborating with other VCs around uh, for example if, if you if you can feel that this company is really needing this type of I don't know deep def VC in in California for example mm -hmm. Uh, are, you, are you collaborating with other VCs or it's it's part of the company activity? Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, very, very important or important uh, question. So, uh, like in the beginning, I, I mentioned about these different models um, uh, that uh, VCs are are sort of uh, minority owners, and also due to our fund size, uh, we really um, we know that many of the companies we invest in they are going to require a lot of capital over the years and we definitely don't have those kinds of resources ourselves. So oftentimes uh, already when we are making our initial investment we are uh, building a syndicate uh, including also other VCs. So, so it is very typical for us to, to uh, collaborate with, with other VCs. Um, then I, I think your sort of the first part of the question related to is there some sort of specific VCs uh, that would be then serving a, a certain sort of kind of a company? Mm, there, there could, there or there there can be, um, but it, I, I think it's also very much related to your own connections and if, if, you, if you have been collaborating with, with a certain person in a certain fund and, and you think they might be actually interested in this case, of course you'd like to intro then the team to them and, uh, and, and ho hopefully then join forces again because uh, if there's a good relationship that, that sort of helps also, also in, maybe in other, other cases. Um, and then I, I think also it's, uh, it's about the brand building. So. Um, there aren't that many, that many uh, deep tech VCs in the whole Nordic region. And uh, actually, I was very positively surprised last time I was, was in the latitude this, this spring that uh, how well Voimo Ventures is known in the, in the sort of deep tech scene. So, so um, I, I, I think it's also building the, building the brand then, and, and, and as we have so easily identifiable um, focus, I, I think it also helps us to uh, to be known then in, in that specific area and uh, but yeah that's uh, that's then then the brand building part and how how sort of attractive you are in the eyes of other investors or or, or then the uh, uh, entrepreneurs hello okay. <laughs> Uh, what's your strategy? Uh, do you understand correctly that usually when you are the deal uh, initiator and uh, you agree the deal terms, is that correct? And uh, is, it, is it when you follow doing the follow-up uh, rounds, do you like to maintain this role or you, you actually find it's your strategy to find a new lead investor, so to speak, to a new round? Yeah. Um, so we typically, when, when, when we are making investments in this uh, very early stages, pre-seed stage or, or seed stages. Uh, we like to be the lead investor in that round. It not, it's not necessary, but we like to be. And, and that's, that is purely because uh, due to our fund size, we need to have big enough stake of the company in the beginning. Uh, many cases, it's difficult for us then to expand our ownership uh, in the later stages because, because of the fund size. So um, uh, and that's why we, um, uh, we, we try to lead, lead the early rounds. Uh, but there are some exceptions, and uh, our sort of home turf is the Nordics and Baltics. So in, in that region, we, we try to be the lead investor. But then we, when we go sort of more beyond uh, the Nordic, Nordic region and our visibility to sort of maybe local uh, Legal structure is, is more limited and, and also our, our uh, access to the deal flow is more limited. Then we are more prone to uh, lean towards local uh, 
uh, lead investors. And, and there we could be then, then the sort of the co-investor if we think the case is interesting from, from our perspective. Um, but then going towards these, let's say, A rounds and beyond, of course, it depends on, on uh, the round sizes. But uh, uh, of course, we like to pack the companies and which are performing well as much as we can in, in those rounds in order to keep our position. But l typically then there is a new lead taking, taking place at latest in the A round. There might be a, maybe another C a seed round before the A round, which we can still lead. Uh, but A, a round and beyond, then, then we even hope that there is someone else to, to lead the round. Good. Um, I, I, I think we are already a bit over time for, for the first session, so should we take a break here and uh, then continue in, in 15 minutes? All right, thanks. So uh, let's continue uh, the, the next part of, of today's agenda. So uh, in, in this part, I'm um, about to discuss uh, of, of evaluating opportunities uh, in general and, and maybe more specifically in, in, the, in, in startups and, uh, and, and how to work with science-based companies and how to uh, build relationships uh, with, with universities and, and, and research institutes. So, uh, sorry, the, uh, the time timer is not on. So, but I, I promise to come back back to you on, on this defining deep tech. And uh, I, I, I think there aren't any like generic um, way which, which which would be then uniformly uh, agreed that this is what deep tech means. But in, in, in practice, it, it means many, many things or can be seen from different angles. And, uh, and maybe one, one observation over the years has been that uh, as deep tech has become sort of a, a bit trendy, many, many funds are, are claiming that they, they do deep tech, which maybe from our perspective doesn't fulfill the criteria, but uh, it is what it is. So, uh, but how we define it, it's, uh, it's in, in very sort of simple terms, uh, it's, it's about the solving exponential challenges or problems uh, through entrepreneurship and science. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and really help, help the founders to, to build businesses uh, which are, are, are then based on science and, uh, but also fulfill the criteria of, of the business being scalable and, and uh, and there is a huge global opportunity for, for that. Um, but maybe in, in more precise terms, I would say that typically the deep tech companies are, are, are companies which, where the value is much more driven by the IP uh, than in, in startups in general. So, and, and they are also trying to solve technically challenging topics uh, or which at least are, are sort of general, generally speaking considered to be technically challenging. Um, <clears throat> so so uh, that's, that's another part of, of, of this, this definition and, uh, and also in our, <clears throat> our scope it also means that uh, the startup is really able to also provide significant societal impact. So I'm not sure if I was able to give you a very sort of explicit or very simple answer to, to the question what deep tech means, but I think because there aren't one, that's, that's, the, that's the reason. But this is how, how, how we at Voima Ventures are defining this, this but uh, as mentioned, there are <coughs> many other, other ways to, to uh, come up with, uh, with, with the definition. Um, then a little bit about the... Uh, the deep tech market in, in, in the area we are, we are active. So just to give you some numbers, in 2021, the whole Nordic 
VC ecosystem. So we, we talk about New Nordics. So the whole Nordic, New Nordic uh, ecosystem um, got investments into the startups approximately 20 billion euros. Out of that, 4.5 billion was addressing this, uh, this deep tech space. Um, and, and that is sort of very significant that, of course, Israel is being considered one of the, globally one of the leading hubs of, of sort of and an leading startup ecosystems. So in terms of the total investment volume, actually New Nordics is about to bypass uh, Israel likely in the coming years. But what comes to deep tech, New Nordics is already bigger than, uh, than Israel. So the, fo the, the sort of respective number in, in Israel was roughly 1.5 to 2 billion uh, investments in, in the deep, techs, uh, deep tech area. Um, then here's our sort of prediction. Um, today, uh, in, in this region, we have approximately 40,000 startups. And uh, we do have approximately 13,000 um, uh, startups which are in the space of deep tech. If we take the time perspective here, so uh, within the past five years, uh, the number of deep tech startups has uh, grown from 9,000 up to 13,000. So almost 50% growth. And we believe that within the next five years, uh, the growth will be actually even even higher, and uh, by the end of 2028, um, we will have uh, altogether 65,000 startups, out of which uh, 26,000 would be um, addressing the deep tech-related uh, uh, areas. So it's a 100% growth. Um, within the next five years that we are, we are uh, predicting. Of course, you can then argue something else, but we've actually done, as, as I mentioned, as we are in fundraising, uh, we've done quite a significant sort of rehearsal in, in, in making the market research and, uh, and understanding the opportunities earlier this year. And, and these numbers are just not sort of uh, from our sleeves, but this is actually based on, on the, the market study we made, and uh, we have been using quite a lot of, a lot of different sources for that. Um, but then, um, about from, from sort of value creation opportunity perspective, um, we did the similar kind of uh, rehearsal when the previous fund was, uh, was being uh, raised, and uh, the numbers were much, much smaller then. Uh, but now we predict that uh, Within the next five years, there will be 400 companies in the deep tech space out of these 26,000 companies, which will achieve the valuation level of 300 million or beyond. And uh, out of those, 50 will be uh, achieving the unicorn level. And we believe, very much believe, that uh, there has been this sort of surge of a digital unicorns during the past decades and uh, and, and uh, you guys in, in in Estonia have have been sort of extremely successful in in that but we do believe that uh, in uh, the next wave of unicorns will actually come out of uh, out of this deep tech space and and the main reasons really are that uh, we are facing challenges like the climate change uh, energy crisis uh, food crisis and, uh, and uh, lack of, lack of uh, pure water, so on, so on. And uh, those don't come away, regardless of, of the sort of the sentiment, current sentiment of, of the financial market. And, and those challenges are something which sort of need solutions from science. And, and that's why we really believe that the sort of next big waves of unicorns will come out of the deep tech uh, ecosystems. And uh, so it's a very simple task we have. We just need to find those 50 companies which will be the, will be the unicorns. <laughs> All right. So um, then moving forward to, to sort of uh, building the deal flow funnel. I, I already sort of uh, discussed about the LP funnel, but then the deal flow funnel, what, what we, how we are building it. I, I think here are the typical sources. And... Um, 
And of course, uh, the inbound is very important in terms of the volume. And uh, uh, we al already discussed a little bit of, of this sort of uh, brand building and, uh, and how well you are rec recognized in the market. So in, in, in that sense, building your brand really sort of uh, benefits also your, uh, your deal flow funnel creation. Um, then the outbound is, is actually uh, at least as important. And uh, now again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about sort of this deep tech angle and, and how we do is do it. But uh, we are regularly uh, visiting all the major universities in, in Finland, also in Sweden, uh, in, 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 uh, in Estonia, and uh, hopefully in other, other sort of uh, major universities in the region in the future as well. Uh, a couple of times a year, we are meeting the research teams um, and in order to identify the most interesting uh, cases uh, there and, uh, and, and then hopefully investing into those later, later on. Then the ecosystem events are very important and of course very also effective way of, of meeting with startups. So we just has, had Slush. How many of you were Slush, by the way? Okay, quite a few, great. Um, so I was actually focusing more on meeting with other GPs because it's, as just discussed, it's very important that uh, you have uh, the connections to, to other VCs uh, to syndicate with. But then part of our team was focusing on, on meeting uh, the startup teams. And uh, I, I think our team met like in two days over 100 companies. So obviously you don't make any deals there, but you have the first introduction and, and then the most in interesting ones are then continued later on. Um, and of course, Latitude 59 is, is one of the big events in the area as well. And uh, then Tech Chill in, the, in Riga and, uh, and uh, uh, Tech Barbecue in, in Copenhagen and so on and so forth. Uh, but then uh, from the quality perspective, I think the, the best way in terms of the hit rate is then the referrals. Uh, so other funds or, or advisors or, or some other sort of business partners have come across a case and, uh, and, and, and they make a referral, would you be interested in taking a look? And I would say that the hit rate is uh, by far the highest in, in the referrals. So, but, but uh, then the other th sort of the flip side of, of the coin is that uh, you, you might get sort of overwhelmed with the deal flow. Uh, for instance, when Voima Ventures was established and, uh, and it, it was uh, sort of quite widely in the local, local sort of media that, that there is now a new, new deep tech fund. And as there weren't one before, there was a sort of huge surge of, of uh, deal flow coming towards us. Very difficult to sort of handle that. Uh, I, I think same same applies also after these events like Slush and others that uh, there's so much deal flow in the, in, on the table that it's very difficult to sort of uh, systematically go everything through. Um, but I, I think it's very important that you um, build your tools and, and approaches so that uh, you can do that in a systematic way. And, uh, and also it it's again comes down to this sort of your brand how well you are, are sort of communicating with the, with the deals that won't get further in your funnel. Uh, the ecosystem is, is small and people tend to talk, talk to each other and if they feel that they've been sort of ghosted or, or, or being sort of uh, not served in a polite way, uh, then, then you might, might get a sort of difficult uh, brand. So, you need to consider that part as well. Um, but then moving towards the, uh, how we are evaluating the, uh, the opportunities. And uh, I, I think uh, there is a quite a strong analogy to the, to the sort of how, how uh, funds are being evaluated, like how, how then the startups are being evaluated. Um, the earlier the stage is, the more the focus in the evaluation phase is really in the team. Is this the team sort of capable of delivering what they're promising? Um, 
that is the first question. Of course, then you 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 also uh, learn the other aspects and uh, and uh, the techn technological sort of deepness and uh, and uh, and all of that. But it really comes down first to the team. What's the what's the founding team? What kind of track record they have? What is their previous experiences and so on and so forth? So it's clear the uh, the the sort of uh, the most important aspect of of, of uh, evaluation. Of course, then sort of in the later stages uh, where we are not that active, when the companies are in revenues or there is a business, then then it's easier to maybe switch persons if if it feels that the, uh, the key persons are not delivering or are not not suitable for their tasks. Um, and also about the team, it's about the ambition level that uh, we just. It doesn't make any sense for us to invest in companies who plan to be the local sort of category winners. Finland is, is a sort of uh, so small market, or, or, or even the Nordics is so small market. If someone is only planning to be sort of uh, win that region, um, it's not for us. Uh, then, then also, I already mentioned about this this sort of team building part, but. Uh, uh, really identifying what are the missing links uh, from the founding team and uh, and where could we find suitable persons to really top up uh, uh, the the founding team especially when it's a sort of a, the most of the founders are researchers it's uh, uh, it, it's something which is very important then the other part is is uh, that the, the innovation um, What's the sort of the challenge uh, the team is trying to overcome? It, it's too many times that you see that there are teams uh, which uh, sort of uh, are doing something where you cannot sort of easily see what's the what's the need for for that. It might be sort of technically advanced, but if it doesn't practically solve anything, why, why is that interesting? So, so that is something you really, really need to need to understand. Um, in our perspective, of course, the scientific uh, part is, is also very important and relevant, and uh, and uh, um, in order to sort of to fulfill this deep tech criteria, I, I, I think um, there there is a lot of sort of deep tech which we consider in the end of the day to be quite shallow tech. In, um, then the, uh, the the market pull and and, uh, and the unfair advantage and, and all of that, but uh, but then the IPR and uh, and uh, is also very important to understand what the, what the team currently has, what are what are the sort of uh, roadmap for the future, how they are planning to expand the portfolio they have, the IP portfolio. Um, not not necessarily everything needs to be patented. Um, patents are are in in many cases they they are a valuable asset, but not not every time. Sometimes it makes sense not to patent something, but instead of that, uh, really uh, use trade secrets. Especially, of course, and, and when you come to more sort of software-driven innovations, uh, it might be even sort of impossible to make patents and uh, uh, for for algorithms or, and and all of that. Um, then the market opportunity, of course, needs to be evaluated. Um, maybe this is more familiar with with with, uh, with you, but um, on the market of really understanding the uniqueness and uh, what's the competitive landscape. It doesn't mean that if, if someone else is is trying to overcome the same challenge, that there there is too much competition, and uh, it's even good to have some competition because then it validates there is a market need for something. So it is not black and white, but of course, it's, it, if it's a completely like red ocean, there, then then it really is a question: what is the value that this team or this innovation is, is able to sort of provide for the market? Um, and then I, I think it's already when making an investment, it's important to have some kind of an understanding: what will be the end game? We are always a temporary owner. We need to have the exit at some point. So understanding um, what are the roads for the exit uh, and uh, whether it's a trade sale, who could be the potential uh, acquirers 
for such business if, if the company is, is able to deliver and, and do what they, they are planning to do. Who would benefit out of that? And, uh, and, and that might in some cases even then, then have an impact to the business model, how the company is being built. Sometimes you see way too difficult sort of structures in the company uh, that you can easily say that if, if you're doing this and even if you are successful, this will be very difficult to sell because it's, uh, it's just sort of too complicated. So that is also an Im important uh, uh, item. And then lastly, I, I think it uh, again comes down a little bit of, of this team, uh, team uh, questions, but the dynamics, uh, how it works, and, uh, but not only between uh, the, the founding team members, but also then, then what kind of advisors and, and or board members, uh, other important persons they have in the team, and how that works. Who are the pot potential other investors joining the round? Um, and uh, what, what kind of team dynamics that would bring in? That's also important to, to discover. Yeah, please go ahead. Xcox, you have highlighted uh, under the diverse team the ownership structure, but mm. you didn't elaborate it there. It would be interesting to understand what is the risk scenarios they're trying to avoid there. Yeah, I, I'll come back to that uh, in a second. Yeah, it's a very important question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then of course the valuation and all of that. So so. Um, valuating a startup company is, is it's a much more of an art than a science. So um, there are some rule of thumbs that can be applied. Of course, we, we see a lot of companies and we have sort of a, like some kind of a gut feeling what's, what's the sort of a typical range. But in the end of the day, it's a, it's a question of how much competition there are. Are there sort of competing syndicates that would like to also invest in the company? Uh, and, um, and, and, and many other things which, which might have an impact to the, uh, how, the, how the company is being evaluated. Uh, but of course, you, you need to have some kind of a consensus on the, on the valuation and other terms quite early on in order to it, it, it to make sense to sort of continue the discussions because uh, otherwise you might be sort of wasting everybody's time. Um, here is a a bit maybe complex uh, uh, illustration on, on how we are processing our, our deal flow. So typically, if, if it's an inbound <coughs> uh, lead we are getting, uh, someone is giving a call or sending an email and, uh, and, and we receive a deck, and, and then, then we have the sort of the first screening, whether it's something that it is suitable for, for our mandate. And, and if not, then there's no point of, of actually uh, arranging a meeting. Um, then if it's suitable for our mandate and, and looks interesting, then we try to arrange a meeting. There could be maybe only one person from our team. And then if, if, if after the first meeting, it's still interesting, then it moves forward. And uh, the person who has met the, met the team, then it is, is uh, introducing the case for, for the rest of the team in our uh, uh, a deal flow meeting with, which takes place uh, every second week and uh, then we decide whether it's something we would actually would like to build like a internal deal, uh, deal team and uh, uh, but it could be that we and, and mostly in, 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 in that phase we are saying okay this is not interesting we either either uh, say no, or then we decide that, okay, this could be interesting, but it actually requires additional like uh, develop, develop, de development uh, from the team, uh, whether it's being the building, a, founding a sort of a co-founder or, or having, having some additional uh, evidence uh, um, uh, for, for the uh, technology or something similar. And it might take a year and then we come back and then, then sort of uh, things are in place and we can continue the discussion. But then moving forward, uh, uh, when we have the deal team and, uh, and we're deepening our understanding, then at some point uh, we start making our internal investment memorandum, uh, which is then presented in the investment committee. And, uh, and then the investment committee is the sort of uh, um, origin who decides over the investments. And, uh, and then the term sheet 
could be already prior having having sort of the decision in uh, in, in investment committee, especially in cases where there is a competition and we need to be sort of very swift. We have the flexibility to provide a term sheet with a quite a sh short notice, but of course then it puts more pressure to the actual uh, sort of due diligence phase um, uh, after after uh, providing the term sheet. Um, yeah, but then sort of the uh, the process continues and uh, and we do the DED. We typically at least we need to have sort of external legal DED just for, uh, sort of uh, confirming that there's no nothing sort of skeletons in the closets um, and typically there aren't and the most value actually comes from that that they are going through all the sort of agreements and uh, and, and the, what the company is having. Um, and there typically they come up with some suggestions for, for, for improvements like uh, uh, for the future and that's, that's very valuable for, uh, for us and for the company. Um, and then of, of course also providing all the, all the needed uh, agreements and, uh, um, uh, and, and between the company and us or shareholders agreements, pr probably also investment agreement then there might be uh, new employment agreements which needs to take place and all of that. So those also need to be covered in, in, in this stage. Um, and then in the final stage, when, when everything is in place and, and we have agreed all the terms, then, then of course uh, is, is the closing. Right, so um, then uh, moving sort of a little bit more towards this environment uh, where, where deep tech funds are typically active, so uh, a collaboration between universities and research institutes and, uh, and how to build that relationship. My, my sort of first f finding is that uh, almost all, every time or always uh, the universities are very open for uh, meeting with investors. And, uh, and making the introductions to the research teams and, and all of that. So it's definitely not a big hurdle to, to have the door opened. Um, I, I, I think it's, for, I guess for many, many funds, it's, it's then the question of, of sort of having, having the trouble of, of going to sort of, uh, and, and meet the teams rather than, than that it, the doors are closed. Um, in, in, in many times, the correct person from university side is, is the, the person who is in charge of the innovation office or there are other like uh, technology office and, and all of that. So, so depending on the universities, there might be different names for, uh, for, for, for uh, uh, that sort of um, task. But, uh, uh, but anyway, they typically know that they have the best visibility to, to the research teams and they also have this sort of understanding our, and are our, our personally sort of commercially driven so that they can identify that these are the teams you, you, you should meet. They are, they are sort of closest to, to establishing a company. Um, I, I think it's very important that, that this is not sort of one-way street in a way that we are going like a grocery shop and, and, and selecting sort of the most important or, or interesting teams and, and only discussing with them. Uh, we also consider this, this as being part of our role in, in sort of supporting and developing the whole ecosystem. So really trying to spar with the teams and, uh, and give feedback and advice what they should take into account when if they are moving towards uh, building a startup and uh, being quite honest also that, uh, that if, you, if you see that there is a, a topic which will very likely be a red flag for, for investors in the future, then you should sort of say that, say that out loud that uh, you are probably not going to be able to attract any, any VC capital prior you have fixed this. And, and this sort of comes down for all the meetings and all the sort of research teams you are meeting with, not only the ones that uh, you are interested in, in sort of uh, moving, moving uh, deeper in, in the discussions. Um, yeah, and, and, and then sort of the last point I've, I have here really is, is this, um, uh, this topic of uh, team building. And uh, 
we are going to discuss it a little bit more uh, in, in the panel later today, but um, I, I think that is definitely a part where, where VCs can add value. I, I think that there aren't any like silver bullet how to fix um, the challenge of colliding like uh, research teams and, uh, and, and then suitable talent to, to, um, to, to uh, join those teams having completely different kind of background, like commercial background or, or something similar. So, so what we can do is, is then leverage our networks really to, <clears throat> to help these, these teams to be more diversified uh, in terms of, uh, um, of having different kinds of skills at stay, uh, in, in a team. So, um, where the science startups are, are then coming out of? So, obviously, the uni universities and research institutions are, are the main source, um, but not the only source. Um, I, I, I think I've been mostly discussing about this, uh, these sort of direct spin-offs uh, coming out of, out of those institutions. But then the other, other really is that there are, are companies which are not necessarily founded in in uh, in, in university, uh, and, uh, and and they haven't come through this sort of uh, technology transfer office route, but there's been some kind of a collaboration uh, in a, in, in a, for a long time between the university and and then the group of people who are are then um, establishing the the new startup, and. Uh, and, and then the third part is, is, uh, is then completely sort of exter external teams uh, which are, are then identifying suitable technology and can, can license that or, or use, it, use it through some other arrangement coming out of the university. And <clears throat> for instance, we have also in companies which are uh, um, in, in this sort of, uh, in the last, last like box here, where the science has, has been sort of brought into the team later on. There has been these, these uh, guys who have been empirically developing something and uh, they understand that it is, it is sort of scientifically uh, very interesting, um, but they haven't had the capabilities of really sort of founding all the causalities and, uh, and, 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 and building the science um, around uh, the actual innovation, and that has then come come only later when after our investment, when the science part has been uh, built uh, on, on on top of the uh, original innovation. Yeah, well, there's uh, just that I, I think this might be very familiar with uh, with many of you. So that how the sort of the start of financing cycle goes and. Uh, and in the beginning, you, you have the death, death, valley of death where, uh, where, where you don't basically have enough uh, like proof or validation or, or the team isn't in place um, and, and very difficult to attract uh, then um, financing. And very typically then you are, you are sort of using these uh, three Fs or some angel investors who, who believe in the case. But then later on, when, when there's more traction, the team is in place, uh, and then, then the sort of more traditional VCs are, are coming into the scene and, uh, and, and financing the company. But then coming back to your question on, on the cap table. So I have one example here, and uh, maybe would like to hear your comments. Do you think this kind of a cap table would work. Any ideas? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, J uh, just on the point. So Many times when, when sort of dealing with these research-based uh, uh, companies, the cap tables might look a little bit of, of that. So there's, 
there's former professors or, or, or advisors who have been having some kind of a role uh, in, in the company, in the history, or even before the company has been established. And, uh, and now they feel that they have sort of earned a significant part of the company and its, its sort of future, future value. But obviously from, from our, from the VC's perspective, uh, this kind of a cap table is completely broken because there are so many persons who are not actively uh, providing or, co or, or, or doing work towards the, to, uh, towards the success of the company. And, uh, and this is very, very difficult for, uh, for VCs. And that's why it's very important that in early on when, when, uh, when the companies are being established already, hopefully before they make any uh, these kinds of mistakes, uh, they are being informed what they should take into account if they would like to then later on attract uh, uh, VCs uh, to the company. And, uh, one of the other, other sort of um, examples, a bit similar examples, is that there's like five founders who are everybody sort of having equal stake of the company. And, uh, and, and that's also very difficult. So our advice is that you could have at maximum of, of, of three uh, founders having equal share. Then you can have sort of co-founders having a small percentage, but, uh, but, but not, not the equals there. Can I ask sure. Is there a mic? Oh. So if, if you have a cap table like that, and it's, I would say it's, it's, it's kind of common to have this type of uh, messy uh, cap tables. Is there any way VC can help to clean this uh, later? Um, yes, there are some. I'm actually coming to that in a, in a, in, a, in a minute. So um, uh, I would say that in general, the chances are are limited, but there are ways. But then, then as I said, that um, if the cap table is like this, then if nothing is being done, it's it's basically a red flag for for us. Um, but before going into that, um, maybe just uh, some examples of sort of typical scenes that early, early stage cap tables have. Um, also, this sort of comes down a little bit on, on the agreement side. Uh, one is, is, is that um, uh, there is no vesting for, for the founders. It is many times a sort of difficult discussion, especially when uh, w w with the founders, especially if it isn't the first funding round um, that they would actually need to put all of their shares under a vesting, sort of, uh, if they've already like worked for the company a couple of years. But that is how, how you do it. So, so very difficult for us to, uh, to have exceptions on, on that. In some cases, we might be flexible on that. It's not 100% of, of the founding shares. It could be then, then a little bit less than that, but still there needs to be a sort of a significant vesting uh, for the founders. Um, well, yeah, we discussed in the previous slide already about these advisors and, uh, and, and, and all of that. Um, but but the, the, the sort of other, other part is, is this sort of strategic sins um, related to really that uh, the long-term play isn't considered um, carefully enough in the early stages and uh, really understanding that the company will require many funding rounds. In sort of a, the rule of thumb is that uh, on each funding round, one third of the company is being sort of uh, sold out or, or, or sort of uh, uh, given, given for the new investors. So you can do the math. So what the, uh, how much the founders need to, uh, need to own in order them to have a decent ownership after three to five uh, funding rounds. And uh, it's always very important for, uh, for an investor that uh, there is this strong um, uh, motivation for the key people to work for the company through the ownership. 
as you know, never in a startup world you are paying high salaries. Well, never is the wrong word, maybe, maybe, maybe somewhere, but very rarely in, in the Nordic scene you see that uh, startups are, are, are sort of paying high salaries. But then, sort of to your question related to how to fix the cap table, um, there are a couple of ways. Uh, I have to say that this is a little bit also sort of a, uh, depending on, on the sort of the legal framework of each country because it comes down also to the tax questions. And um, I'm, I don't know, I, I, I guess that there are a lot, a lot of similarities between the Finnish and Estonian uh, practicalities, but uh, um, of course I, I think the, the most typical and, and that is um, most typical way is really then, then to sort of uh, build option pools uh, for uh, for for uh, the key employees, and if the pool is high enough, then the persons who are passive and non non investing uh, parties, then they will be diluting sort of uh, to much smaller, more or less stake in in a company. Um, in in Finland, we have this quite new new way of of having this directed share issue, which can be done with quite sort of uh, attractive terms. That's another way. It's a basic, the similar uh, end result as with uh, uh, with options, but the only difference is that with this arrangement, uh, these are considered as as, as shared and will be uh, will be then taxed according to uh, capital gains rather than than income income gains, uh, which is then then the case with with options. Um, then the third opportunity is, is then to arrange some kind of a sort of secondaries between these passive early stage uh, owners or professors or what have you uh, and, uh, and, and then the new key, key employees uh, in the team. Uh, those might be also, those might be difficult discussions and, uh, uh, but, but necessary if, if, the, if the cap table is broken. A question here. Sure. Which of those three do you see most oftenly and most successfully used? Um, well, I would say that the option pool is, is the most sort of commonly used and, um, and almost all of our companies have some kind of an option pool. And typically it's more towards the new recruitments who don't have the sort of existing ownership that we would like to uh, make them to be motivated to work for the company for, for several, several years. Uh, but the options can also be um, applied in, in this context to clean the, clean the cap table. And one more uh, as we're here on the cap table. Mm -hmm. So um, about the university's ownership uh, of the equity of the spin-off. So um, it might be a difficult topic, but uh, so how do you see that? Uh, what kind of percentage of an equity would you feel, co feel comfortable with uh, for the university or for the research institute or something? So just a bit of elaboration on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, excellent question. And, uh, and uh, to a point that uh, it is a difficult, difficult topic. Um, I, I think we're going to cover this a little bit more in the in the panel discussion. But in general terms, I would say that um, up to 10% is is sort of decent. And uh, <clears throat> but then then you see cases, for instance, in Finland, there are certain universities saying that we want to have 25% of the of the founding shares, and uh, and which almost makes already the sort of uh, company cap table broken. So. Um, and the one challenge is that there aren't like a, like a uniform way to tackle this this question. So each university and, and, and has a little bit a little bit sort of different approach to this topic. But we'll have a discussion. Marat is the, is the expert in the area, so we'll <laughs> no, come it's, back. It's to this. good to hear that not only in Estonia is such problem. No, no, so it's uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then and for instance, in Estonia and in Finland. Uh, the university owns the IP, and uh, and then there is this sort of tech transfer. In Sweden, uh, actually, the researchers own the IP, so it's a little bit easier to to sort of tackle that part of, of the equation. The challenge is is then that there might be ten researchers who have participated in, in the sort of certain research group, and then they are in the cap table. So uh, that's not sort of optimal either. All right. Um, Maybe just 
quite briefly then, then um, about the key agreements. So, of course, um, it's very important to have, first of all, the shareholders agreements and, uh, and investment agreements in place um, from early on. Um, otherwise, it might, uh, might sort of end up in a very difficult situation later down the road. Um, then the tech transfer, uh, tech transfer agreements, and actually here, here I'm a little bit sort of also, also sort of coming to your question on this, this take of, of, of universities, which is sort of reasonable. Um, but uh, one also observation from, um, from, from this part of the uh, process is that the teams really should start the discussion with the university uh, early on, because it might take time, it might, might be difficult, depending on the university, but there could be, could be uh, different kinds of, of uh, things that you don't even recognize in the beginning of the process, but they might then be the sort of the uh, unknown unknowns. Um, there are sort of quite typically, there could be challenges related to the scope of the license or, or scope of the IP that the university doesn't give the sort of all rights to the startup. Uh, it might be that it, it's uh, geographically limited or, or, or it's uh, sort of uh, from the business perspective limited. And so it's very important for uh, the startup to make sure that they have enough flexibility also sort of for, for, for many years to come to maybe expand their business to a little bit different verticals if, if it seems feasible. So, but again, this is, this is a little bit challenging, but uh, at least our sort of experience says that this is the best uh, moment to, to discuss about those terms. Uh, later on, uh, if the company is very successful and they would like to expand, uh, it, it's actually um, much more difficult than, than uh, dif make a deal because uh, then the university also see that there's a lot of value in the IP they have. Um, and, and, and in here, again, there's also some tax-related uh, questions which might, might uh, pop up. Uh, then the uh, 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 shareholders agreement, uh, it's, it's good to good sort of practice to use these uh, uh, templates which are commonly available or, or sort of an, an in, th th sort of uh, commonly agreed that they, they, are, they are feasible for companies. Uh, the seriousseed.com is, is something that we are, we are using quite often. I, I think it's a, uh, in, in Finnish legal framework, but uh, I, would, I would guess that it's uh, quite sort of suitable for, for many other, <coughs> other uh, countries as well. And then the sort of employment agreement, agreements is also, also sort of an important uh, uh, aspect. First of all, that there are in, in employment agreements and, uh, and, and there they are sort of according to the local law. And, uh, and especially then the IP part of, of, of that is, is important. So if, if it's not sort of explicitly agreed what happens with the IP, uh, that the employees are, are devel developing uh, during their employment period, uh, it, it, it's not necessary that uh, it belongs to the company. So that's why it's important to sort of specifically define what is the sort of uh, IP related, related practicalities and, and all of that. And then of course these uh, good liver, bad liver terms or, or vesting periods and, and, and all of that as we already discussed. Good, so I, I think uh, I've approximately used the time of, uh, for, uh, for, for this part I was planning to use, so happy to answer any questions on, on these topics uh, if you have, have any. So it's, it's quite typical, uh, one recommendation that for regular startups, one should have at least like 50% of uh, the cap table for founders. Uh, in the Series A stage, 
are there like any differences when it comes to like deep tech companies? Like typically it's 50, but could there be any differences? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, 50 after which stage? A series A. Um, well, I, I, I wouldn't say that there aren't that many differences or, or, or deep tech is that, that different from, from any other startups in that sense. I, I think the sort of ownership intense in incentive is the same for for all, all, all sort of startups regardless of, of the domain. So I would say that it holds also for uh, for deep tech startups. But of course that it might be that in, in, in some business models the um, the capital requirements are just so much more or so much so much bigger that it would be even better to have a little bit more share uh, for the founders compared to maybe some some digital companies but uh, but of course the other the flip side of the coin is that that it is also for the investors in, important that they have their at their stake as i mentioned in for for instance for us that uh, we have big enough stake in the beginning because we know that the companies require a lot of funding and uh, and we will be also getting diluted so it doesn't work from our fund math perspective if if our our stakes are too low thanks just i will use all my chances to ask the questions um Way back, there was a slide with uh, seed round, A round, B round, uh, mm -hmm. and there was um, a small hint on the valuations as well uh, over there. So uh, were those valuations on the slides, um, if I remember correctly, seed round 1.7 million to three maybe or something? Um, is this already like those correct, like for nowadays economy, uh, corrected valuations? Or is this a normal in, in deep tech? Or, or like in Estonia, at least we see much higher valuation. We've seen much higher valuations. Yeah. So, what's the comment on that? Yeah, um, it was maybe maybe a, a little bit poor example. It, it was just an example. Uh, in uh, what we see, there's a quite a wide range of of valuations already in the pre-seed round, depending on on several different things, depending on how much research there is. Uh, what's the research base uh, before uh, the company is being launched um, uh, what's the sort of the visibility to sort of a market opportunity how experienced the team is for instance there has been in finland a couple of uh, companies uh, coming out of out of uh, uh, vtt where the pre-seed round already has been over 10 million sort of the, the, the fundraise they've made, like IQM and uh, more recently this, this uh, one go. Um, so it's very difficult to say that the range is this. Typically, I would say that uh, these pre-seed rounds we see in the deep tech space, the valuations are maybe in between of, of uh, two to five million uh, range. Um, uh, depending on how much ra capital is raised and and, uh, and and the previous facts I I, I told you about, but uh, but really it, it, there is no like uh, that you would say that if it's higher than this it's too much or if it's lower than this it's cheap. Any, any corrections seen lately? Um, well, I would say that in the deep tech space um, there hasn't been such a bubble maybe than in in some other areas. And, uh, and definitely not in these very early stages. You can see that there is a valuation pressure, to, uh, sort of uh, downwards pressure in, uh, in the later stages uh, where the fundraises are also tens of millions. There, there I, I think the scene has changed. And also that the requirements for these follow-on rounds have, have been increasing. So I would say that those are the, those are the main changes, that, but, uh, but I, I wouldn't say that there's been a sort of huge like valuation drop, like 80%, like in the SaaS businesses. Yeah. All right. Yes. So thank you for this, and I will continue in, in 10 minutes with the, with the panel. All right, hey, 
Uh, let's then continue the afternoon, and uh, it's nice to have now some company on stage. Uh, we're going to have a panel discussion related to how to create value out of science. And um, in more specifically, we are covering top topics related to tech transfer and, and also sort of uh, ideas related to how we could play it right for the region, including both Estonia and Finland, sort of being very close to each other. Um, but before going into the actual, actual topic, I would like to invite Mart and Vitali on, on stage, and uh, maybe you could have a short introduction, both of you, on, on yourself and uh, your backgrounds. Great, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Mart Masik, and uh, my background is uh, 20 plus years in, uh, in the business development in the corporate field primarily, but I have been also an entrepreneur myself, angel investor, and, uh, and the you know, banking and innovation Field. I think this is the kind of common, common ba uh, path that I have carried further. But at the same time, also, I've been one of the co-founders of the largest entrepreneurship competition in Estonia. So I have seen the corporate field and also have seen really early stage companies beforehand. So, and, and yes, a year and a half ago, uh, uh, I looked at something new to learn. And then we figured out that uh, Unit Tartu Venture was founded. And it's 100% owned by the University of Tartu, uh, asset management investment company. And especially designed to, uh, to establish the framework how we deal uh, IP created under the, your research uh, teams and to become successful entrepreneurs uh, who will take it further and, and build great businesses. So yes, I'm uh, in the dual role now. So first of all, I'm the investment uh, director of the Unitar to Venture. And yes, now just like a bit month ago, uh, we, we opened up the broader topic, how the entrepreneurship in the University of Tartu works and, and how we will build it further. So I'm also having the head of entrepreneurship of the University of Tartu. So that's my second role. Good. And I maybe just uh, I understood that uh, of, of your sort of free time hobbies that uh, for instance kite surfing is something that is, is, is something you do on, on top of sort of uh, snowboarding and stuff which is maybe more more traditional but uh, how did you end up in, in kite surfing that's an interesting interesting <laughs> hobby <laughs> yeah I, I always uh, like to learn something new and, and I think this is a really great way of doing so and also my, my job rules beforehand no of them haven't been existed beforehand mm. so I think this kite surfing and and also snowboarding. I think that's really kind of like uh, uh, looking where the edge is and, then, <laughs> and what you can do more and what you can is the, uh, discover more. So I think yeah. this is a really great way to, to, to get the new perspectives. Uh, and I enjoy every ride. So yeah. that's the part of it. That, uh, not the day or yesterday, not the same as it was before. Yeah, great. OK, great to have you here. And, and Vitaly, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm originally from Ukraine. Uh, so I was born in Ukraine. Uh, then I went, you know, eventually went to the uh, Learn Computer Science in University, but somehow I ended up in Estonia uh, more than eight years ago. First, I started as an exchange student. I was uh, studying here human-computer interaction, so uh, more from you know the hardcore mathematics, applied mathematics, and computer science to interaction design, user experience, and then I started to work in TransferWise, now called Wise. So I worked there for three years. Uh, building public API and doing global partnerships, so uh, integrating with banks and businesses. That was a great experience because, as you all know, WISE grew like hell, and I was exactly at this moment for hockey stick growth. It was pretty interesting. And then uh, I decided to make my life harder and uh, go to Starship Technologies <laughs> uh, to seek even more challenges. That was also very interesting. And there I dealt with uh, real-time uh, robots delivery planning, so we were increasing uh, you know, how robots were driving um, over the city, where each robot should go. Uh, as you know, all of them are 97% or 98% autonomous, maybe even now more. Uh, sorry, Akhti, if I say it wrongly. Akhti is the founder of Starship. Uh, but now I am a CTO and co-founder of Better Medicine. And what we do here in Better Medicine, we enable radiologists to do cancer diagnostics faster and more accurately. Uh, by giving them AI tools, AI power tools, to analyze uh, medical images and overlay with uh, important information like found tumors or cysts. Uh, and by this, we help them not miss cancer uh, or some, let's say, cysts or other things, uh, but also do it much faster. Yep. That's shortly about me. Good. And uh, I, I personally, I, I like to run. And, uh, but I've learned that you are actually a barefoot runner. 
I was yesterday running and in the Helsinki region it was snowing very heavily. And, but Vitaly is actually running with his bare foot also on snow. So how did that happen and how yeah, did you end up doing that? It's actually that? true. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I live near Pascula Raba in Neme and people uh, I usually run in snow like for 10 minutes. And people think I'm crazy when I'm like running and person looking at me and I'm in shorts and t-shirt and like completely barefoot. They're like, first they're saying, you do, <laughs> which means like uh, power to you, you know, to run. Um, but yeah, then they ask like what's happening. But I think uh, it came to me after I did started to do cold exposures. So I started to do Wim Hof method and then I just started to experiment. It really yeah puts you a bit out of comfort zone. Great. Hey, but let's then move forward to the topic of today. And, uh, and I've been a little bit sort of touching upon the theme of, of tech transfer already um, uh, during the previous sessions. But uh, maybe, Marat, if, if you would like to elaborate a little bit of, of, of this topic, as this is your home turf, but how would you sort of describe the, the tech, tech transfer process? What are the do's and don'ts and the typical challenges and, and all of that? Yes, I think it's a super interesting field uh, to, to, to uh, constantly keep learning. So I think I'm really I think knowing a bit of it, but still a lot to learn. Overall, I think I see that uh, under the university's umbrella and research institutes, there is great uh, the, kind of the work going on. And then I think the challenge is at how we transfer it to the, to the market. So I think this is the starting point of it. And, and uh, historically, it had been also in, here in Estonia, quite not a common practice, but I think what we also learned that every case is unique. And I think uh, people who have deal with the tech transfer, I think they're also thinking about this is like the deal by deal. Mm -hmm. So, but I think uh, when we're thinking about the, the, the potential uh, from the, from the um, uh, applied research to, to commercialize, I think uh, it's not scalable. So, mm. so I think this is the part of it. And in most cases, the, one of the biggest challenges at the beginning is that uh, most cases, those founders are the first time founders. So, and that's the normal things, whatever you do first time, it's really hard to understand how the future look like if you never has been there. So, so I think that is the, maybe the biggest challenge from the founder's point of view. You are e kind of inventing the, the, the future by yourself and, and discovering, and you don't know what you don't know, as you mentioned some, once time before. And that is, I think, the hard part of it. So mm. especially for the founder's point of view. And of course, another play is that uh, you can't uh, succeed alone. Mm. So you have to collaborate. So, and I think the way how you started as a founder, in uh, most cases, I think quite often it is so that under your you, uh, research team and then you, 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 you are part of the one of type of the culture. But once you're starting to meet market and once you're starting to meet investors' perspectives, mm -hmm. that's really the new perspectives which coming into the play as well. So, and then that's a big second news. So mm. I think uh, but maybe the kind of the part is that how to play it right and how to manage expectations mm. uh, from the day one. Because I think you said about there was the question that can you fix the cap tables and so on. Yes, of course you can, but it's quite painful. Yeah. So <laughs> what, what, what if we could do it right from the, from the day one and we're putting the, the perspectives and expectations right? I think this is, I think, the opportunity that mm. definitely I, I see. And, and when we started to establish the unit are to venture, I think, uh, and we initially we said about, let's take the few example cases and then we build actual process how it could work. So not building the house before ready and then opening, big opening and looking who will come in, rather taking case by case. And I think we also looked for different perspectives, uh, models, uh, Nordics, and then my first naive plan was that I have study uh, in, in Stanford, GSP, uh, corporate innovation, and I know a bit of this model there. Also, I have worked uh, four years in, in Stockholm. I know the way how it works in Sweden. I naively thought about, I have this knowledge here and this knowledge there, and then we build the student model, and that's it. So, But actual reality is much more, more, more uh, complex, and then we have to respect the, the, the also history, mm. how things have been in the past. So you cannot only rebel, but also you have to respect, uh, and that's building the bridges. So I think we are in the understanding and our division, how the perfect model looks like, becomes quite clear now. Mm -hmm. and, and primarily it is kind of being, bringing all the stakeholders around the table at the beginning and managing expectations uh, as early as possible. Mm. So I think this is the good way of it. And then and, and the second learning as well is about the valuation of the IP. Mm. So how we are defining what is actual optimal value of IP. And that's another like the big challenge also in the different uh, perspectives to come on the same ground. And, and that we also have learned that uh, when you're thinking about uh, 
the companies not becoming successful if they don't have the first technology. So from that point of view, it's absolutely understandable that you have to put the foundation of the first technology. But, but nowadays, we see more and more the technology lifetimes become shorter. So, mm. so I think how also managing this part of it, and then I think the, the, the goal really is from the University of Tartu and, and, and the University of Tartu Venture point of view, how we are building long-term relationships with the founders because we're on the unit art ventures, what we would like to have 10 years great relationship. But mm. if we are already starting a bit differently with different expectations from the day one, I think it's not going to be a fun ride actually. So I think this is like another part of it, mm. how we're building the long-term uh, relationship. So maybe those are the three main uh, chapters, uh, what I think is, is potential uh, from one point if you would have what we haven't really used really well. And the same time, I think um, uh, challenges that we have to have to play right. Good. Yeah. Thank. Thank you for that. Um, then Vitali, you have a very sort of impressive uh, career already with with startup in, in different roles. Um, have you any any sort of experiences from from tech transfers as an entrepreneur? And uh, what do you see that are sort of the main main sort of framework or support what what universities can provide to help companies to succeed and help entrepreneurs to succeed mm -hmm. yeah I, I haven't had experience with tech transfers per se uh, like you know transfer of IP or stuff mm -hmm. like that uh, in transfer wise you know I, I, everything was built kind of in-house starship by the way is a unique case where I don't know how many people know but both the robots including a lot of hardware uh, the chips and everything is produced in-house so there's no really, there was no buyout of some IP, and Starship, what Starship does, Starship heavily patents everything in mm -hmm. a very successful way, I would say. And this is, uh, in Better Medicine, what we do as well. We have a pretty innovative technology to remove custom human labeling for computer tomography images. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some certain unique approach, uh, how um, we can use, the, let's say, the training data and what kind of data we use to um, avoid the manual labeling of computer tomography images. And uh, yeah, we're currently uh, patenting that, uh, that, um, that thing. Uh, we are applying for the patent. And of course, we have consultants. So mm -hmm. I would say one advice is, if you're patenting something, uh, get a very good patent advisor. That's very important. Um, but other than like acquiring, or um, then I don't have experience. Regarding university, we do have experience of dealing with university because uh, I don't know if you know Dmitro Fishman. Yes. He's uh, well. He's uh, turns out to be our chief uh, science officer in Better Medicine, and uh, he's also in University of Tartu. Mm. So it seems to be. Oh, is there a conflict of interest? Uh, but actually, there was none because uh, I think the agreement was very good in the sense that uh, how to say it's important just to be very transparent in all the parties, like how much time is spent where and what is the kind of mutual benefit for both parties. Because university, of course, is interested to uh, have, how to say, to involve industry in, uh, their, in their research uh, development. Uh, because, for example, you know, then PhD students might have interesting ideas and collaborate with uh, companies like us mm -hmm. to build some things. Uh, then, of course, the question is, where is IP? As, as long as you're transparent, let's say, even if the company wants to retain IP, uh, but as long as it's very transparent from the beginning, uh, then this is important, but mm. because in the end, university also gets something in return. They get people who get experience in these companies, etc. Uh, but I think the key is just to be transparent regarding IP. But uh, the collaboration is definitely possible, and we have this collaboration in the University of Tartu. Yeah. Very good. Um, and maybe sort of continuing this IP topic. So, um, how do you, uh, in practice, in, in 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 Tartu University, who is evaluating the IP? And, uh, and how, how does the sort of value for, for, for the research which, which has taken place in the university is, is being sort of set up? Yeah. Uh, we are like uh, now in the phase that um, one is about like uh, we're building IP and then helping to, to define the IP strategy part of it. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the involvement of the, of the, of the IP uh, creation. I think this is one of the part that we're putting on the table as a value from our side. And definitely, it's also depending how far the, the, the process is, actually. Mm. So, so I think we are taking this as a background uh, into, into account. And we have a traditional model of the licensing uh, mm. framework, so which is kind of like yeah. normal pra best practice. But it becomes more um, interesting from that angle when we're thinking about uh, 
uh, IP for equity transactions. So it's not mm -hmm. only about IP as, as, a, as a patent uh, that you will get access uh, through the, to the licensing on transfer, but I think when we're talking about like the IP as a part of your, your company assets, mm -hmm. and when we're talking about the equity position. So we have figured it out that the licensing model, that works quite well, and that, that's, that's clear, but IP transactions, rather we are on towards to the, to the logic that there is some certain services, so-called, that we're putting on the table from our side, mm -hmm. and it's equaling some, some, some uh, part of the value. So, mm. so, and then we look at the range, and it's also under the founder uh, uh, decision mm -hmm. that do I want to get those services from a university? Because I think there is some proof of concept development uh, funding and, and some business development funding and so on. But those services are, are available for the, for the founders and then they can decide. And mm. they know that on the decision making, as you're saying, really transparent, that do I want to have this service, which is adding the value of the IP creation and then my company value creation? Uh, do I want to have this service or I don't? Mm. And that's, I think, the current concept that we are now, now thinking about and, and experimenting so that mm. uh, there will be service and value creation based decision making made by the founders uh, and then that's equaling on the transfer and transfer of IP momentum some certain uh, range of the of the value that we're asking for exchange mm. of the IP exactly yeah maybe if, if I just uh, may comment that maybe a little bit from the VC perspective and uh, maybe from the Finnish perspective as well so Basically, I, I think in most cases, the startups would like to have the IP owned by the startup. Uh, but we also do have investments where actually, uh, the, as, as you said, uh, the, the IP is licensed. But I, I, I think from investor perspective, it is important then to understand what happens uh, uh, at the time of exit, who owns the IP and, uh, and, and what kind of sort of uh, agreements needs to be in, taking place in order that the, the company doesn't lose its value if it's, if it's not directly uh, owning the IP. Um, then maybe the other, other part is, is uh, what we see quite a lot in Finland, that actually the, uh, the IP is being evaluated by a sort of third party, some, some kind of a patent, patent attorney. Uh, of course, you can, you can sort of uh, then, then argue whether the valuation is, is uh, how market-based it is, but uh, but some consider that, that that is the sort of best way to have some kind of a market pricing for uh, uh, for the IP. Um, but I, I I think that there really aren't one size fits all kind of a solution uh, mm -hmm. for 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 this question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I agree. This uh, our also the primary intention is that we will transfer IP mm -hmm. uh, to the companies, which is I think. Uh, of course, a lot of responsibility for the companies as mm -hmm. well to, to carry it further, but also I think it's clear cut from that point yeah. of view who owns it and who have to carry it further. So I have, we have like one clue in from our point of view to bring it back in the case if the company um, uh, let IP go. So I mm. think this is I think the only part, but, but we really believe that the primary and most effective model to, to, to convert the, the um, uh, IP created under the university umbrella to the market is through the entrepreneurship. Yeah. So this is, I think, the primary thinking and, and, and I think the mindset uh, around our university um, um, board and, and, and stakeholders is really that, uh, that let's bet on that. So because yeah. we don't have historically in Estonia also not too much great examples how we are getting great licensing uh, revenues. Yeah. So rather let give it, give it and, and let's, let's put it available and, and, and that, that will trigger is also more Knowledge, because I think one of the challenges really is, to, as I mentioned, is first-time founders, but I think the overall awareness about what is IP and, and how to deal with IP. Mm. I think this market also have to be educated. And I think this is also a better way to educate if you give it uh, available for more people then mm. they can use with it, the understanding what is the value it, and you, you learn it right or wrong, but you will learn. So, so I think that's, I think, to open up more uh, and not protecting as much we can. I think this is the mindset that we're really having. And, and I, I think, yeah, we have this luxury here in Estonia that we don't have any long-term specific system available. I think we are now under the designing phase, I could say, how the uh, deep tech IP transfer model for the Nordics might look like. Mm, exactly. Good. Uh, before concluding maybe this, this tech transfer, discussion and, and moving towards sort of team building topics, I would like to ask if there's any questions from the audience related to, to this part. Yeah, please. Yeah. 
So we have both sides of the table here sitting. Uh, let's be pragmatic. Uh, what is the percentage if we are talking about licensing, about uh, uh, equity share you would like to see from the university side and from the VC side? You mean IP transfer that you will you will get uh, owning the IP? I think we, we we believe that the reasonable range is between uh, like the five to ten percent most cases. So and I think definitely the the mindset is as well that if it's uh, not investable from that point of view, no one will be benefit out from it. So mm -hmm. so I think we we put this kind of the, the ceiling on the mindset. There are some exceptions. There is some foundations have in invested heavily. I think this this is another part of it. So that that will be a bit different case. But I think when you're thinking about, it doesn't uh, start from the cost-based analysis from the university side. Even there has been some 10-year research in history, but the value of it is actually market will tell them a value of the, the, the research. So I think we're putting this understanding that it has to remain um, investable, and that's it. This is the the principle what we we're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that uh, from the VC perspective also do understand that there, there is a value for, for the IP and uh, we don't expect uh, startups to get that for free. I, I, I'm sort of very much aligned with the 5 to 10 percent ownership is, is completely doable uh, for, for the universities. I, I think this also comes down to a question of, of sort of on, on then on sort of country level or, or sort of the country's economic scene level, what is the uh, objective for, uh, for these tech transfers? Whether it's uh, to try to establish as many new businesses as possible, hopefully many of those will be successful and providing a lot of uh, then, then t tax euros for the country, or whether it's, it's then a way for the university to, to really uh, gain as an owner, when when the uh, uh, the startups is, is is being sold, and uh, I I think that's also a little, sort of a difficult difficult topic, and uh, at least in Finland, it's uh, not completely clear that w w what is the overall sort of uh, objective of 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 the whole tech transfer mm -hmm. uh, uh, process. Yeah, and I think this equity-based approach also uh, gives us a skin in the game for universities. Yeah. It's not about like p remaining passive owner. I think this is the part of the University of Tartu and uh, putting the separate vehicle to keep those equity positions and help those, those companies to succeed in the longer run as well. And building the bridge back to the universities. So I think as we have the small country, always lack of the talent. So how those companies, and that's I think better medicine is a great example, yeah. how those companies are getting back, giving back for the, for the, for the uh, development of research work mm -hmm. as well. So this is kind of the loop. I think we have to build it, and I think it's and everyone in the around the table, not another side of the table, but we are around the table, and we have to all together play it right and, and play in the long run. So I think this is the mindset that uh, that needs to be there. Otherwise, uh, uh, there is no success. Good. Hey, um, in the interest of time, I suggest that we move forward to the uh, next topic, which is uh, really how to build a successful model for, for building teams. Uh, and, um, and, and of course, we've been already discussing today about the challenge of, of uh, identifying suitable talents for, for the teams, and uh, especially when they are very research heavy. Um, but uh, uh, maybe, maybe starting from from you, Vitali. What are your experiences in, in the startups you have been working on on the recruitment and uh, and and finding suitable talent, and and also sort of the collaboration between universities and uh, and, and and maybe recruiting from there. Uh, what kind of kind of obs observations you have? Yeah, thanks. <coughs> well, first, we all know hiring is hard. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, in uh, TransferWise the Starship, uh, I was involved in hiring, as I think especially in TransferWise, uh, every engineer is heavily involved in hiring. I think the, the most important thing about hiring is that you have to make sure you hire people who align with your values, uh, values, principles, practices, because you can teach skills, actually, uh, very fast. Let's say, when I joined Starship, I didn't know any of the technology stack that was in Starship. In TransferWise, we used Java. In uh, Starship, we used Go and Node.js. In TransferWise, we used uh, you know, certain database. In Starship, it was different. So completely different things. But it didn't matter, because you know, as a software engineer, you come there, and uh, uh, you can learn those skills very fast. But aligning on values is very important. And actually, the first thing 
we did, for example, uh, in our team in uh, Better Medicine, we came up with a document uh, called, we called the uh, Values, Principles, and Practices. And it was, it's like our manifesto, uh, what we care about, what we value in terms of our work, and uh, like both you know, work values, uh, even personal values. And this is very important because if we, when we hire, see that someone doesn't really match with that, then it's a no-go. Uh, regarding universities, um, yeah, maybe a, a little bit regarding the talent, uh, then um, another thing about engineering, it's kind of interesting uh, when you talk about, like, when you hire for tech, uh, because uh, I think, um, well, maybe I'm coming from the background of, let's say, product engineering, because in TransferWise, um, people, how to say, uh, engineers were hired as product engineers who were end-to-end -end involved in the mm. product. They were talking to customers, thinking which metrics or what feedback loop to have to measure the success, then implementing back-end, front-end, whatever is needed, talking uh, to customers. I know some companies do a very segregated hiring, meaning there is a front-end guy, there's a back-end guy, there's this guy, and it's very, very, very isolated uh, roles. And this might be dangerous in the beginning of the, comp of the let's say, if you're a very early stage, because, uh, well, you don't have capacity to hire people with such a, how to say, uh, in a very focused way, and it actually may hurt your company, because everyone will only be, uh, I don't know, uh, focused on their one little thing, but not uh, caring about the big picture. So for me, uh, as a CTO, for example, it's very important, it was very important uh, to hire, uh, currently I hired two software engineers uh, in my team, and we call, like, we call each other product engineers, so they're doing end-to-end. We do have AI separately because our AI is very specialized regarding medical imaging. So we do have AI and software engineering separately. Uh, but when it comes to software engineering, we don't have any, how to say, uh, any more uh, specializations. So that's one thing to consider. Uh, regarding university, uh, we do have, uh, let's say, certain people whom uh, we were able to, how to say, uh, get involved. Mm -hmm. And again, it's very important if you get them involved that you have a contract with them and you pay them. Mm. Because if you want, let's say, some people from university, and of course it should be, again, very transparent with all the stakeholders that you know that they actually, everyone agrees that they can spend time in your company as well. But then it's important that you pay them for this work, that it doesn't come at the expense of the university. Because then there will be a question about IP. If, uh, let's say, the time that the person spends is paid by university, then you cannot uh, claim IP. So it's very important to be very transparent that if you involve someone from university, you have a contract with them, and it's very clear that whatever they do for you, uh, the IP stays for you. Of course, if everyone agrees on that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very, very good point, that uh, sometimes there might be question marks in, in that kind of a situation, or if are in general used as consultants, who then owns the IP? But uh, yeah, that's a very important point. Um, how about you, Mart? Uh, of course, uh, looking looking at the scene from from a sort of different angle, uh, what kind of ways you have identified for for attracting good talent to sort of uh, support and the early teams and uh, and the sort of the research base, maybe having a completely different kind kind of uh, background. Yes, I think uh, building up uh, both sides, the business and tech uh, side, I think this is really a success and you also mentioned in your previous uh, talk, I think this having this holistic view uh, and that what we see there is uh, great technologies and I think yes, the research is starting from the mm -hmm. technology angle point of view, but I think we're building up this business understanding and also respect towards business. Mm -hmm. So I think I think to being open-minded, I think first of all from the from the tech people and and the researcher side, I think for the business people, and there is two options: do they want to learn this as a, as, a, as a role uh, mm -hmm. to become also a slash slash um, a business person, mm -hmm. or or building the relationship with the people who who does it really well mm -hmm. or who have done it before? I think the the, the key I think is really to to be respectful for the business and the marketing uh, market side. Uh, from the tech teams, uh, and that's the prerequisite for the, for being open-minded and to be mm -hmm. a good listener and, and good learner. Uh, and the second, I think what I have seen, the best model works if uh, not the, the junior business people not joining, but rather I think there will be some 
they they might be uh, also the kind of like the uh, entrepreneur resident profiles, but I think really experienced entrepreneurs mm. uh, uh, and who have done it before. And that's a bit of challenge in Estonia that uh, we don't have that generation of the people who have built up previous uh, tech businesses uh, uh, history historically. Mm. So I think this is maybe the other local challenge. But other uh, regions in, in in Sweden and 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 in in US, I think there is quite normal path is that, that you are becoming, first of all, a researcher, you're becoming successful, you go to corporate world, you will learn, you will build your own business, and then you're starting to build the next one. So I think mm. this is like the cycle, that, and our, our like the infrastructure here is not so mature yet. So mm. I think we don't have those people, but that's the best uh, to have experienced mm. uh, uh, business people who have done it uh, before, and they have enough pa pa patient as well for the, for the tech people to get learning going. So I think the building relationship uh, uh, is the key, uh, and, and it takes time. Mm. Uh, definitely, it takes time. So I think uh, I don't believe in the in the short-term matchmaking events. That uh, here are the business people, here are the tech people. Here is nice event. Here are the beer and 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 snack, and and let's let's come friends now. It's it's really happens. I think you yeah. start to build the relationship uh, and the based on the values. Yeah. I think this is really the part. But you're mm -hmm. but you're also Vitali mentioning from from his point of view that if you have the common ground. But before you're starting to learn each other values, I think you have to build the trust. Mm -hmm. so that's even the prerequisite for it. Mm -hmm. And there is the trust, and then you're starting to learn, and uh, and then you're building the common value value ground to, to mm -hmm. build the businesses. Mm. Uh, how do you see that? Uh, obviously, I, I, I think Estonians have been very successful in, in building startups in the software space. But now maybe the deep tech is the next wave also here, and uh, but maybe utilizing uh, those experiences uh, who have been successful in, in building sort of these uh, digital platforms, uh, then becoming an entrepreneurs or I don't know coaches, advisors, what have you, for for these sort of newly established deep tech companies. Do you think that there is a potential which could be sort of more utilized? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. That that's the, what we have, and that's that's great. And mm. and also, uh, I see the the investors ground. I think to being more more patient mm -hmm. and uh, and more respectful. I think that the part of it and understanding mm. that uh, tech takes twice more time mm. and twice more money than the, than your mm. previous businesses. So mm. uh, and and also it's a bit risky at the beginning. So mm. that you you go under the water for the longer time. So yeah. and and I think this is the understanding to to not become uh, too. Uh, on patient, I think yeah. this is the, the part of it, and and we definitely we have critical mass of the investors already, mm. uh, local ones here who who understand it, this play really well. Yeah, and 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 I think the founders, yes, they will also follow. But mm. I think, uh, uh, yeah, it's yeah, I think we are moving in the right direction overall, and I think this is really the what we're having as asset that mm. we can we can replicate on the yeah. on the deep tech side, and there is also what you mentioned. There is quite uh, grace, and I think and better medicine is also a bit of it that you started before the business, then you define you as a deep tech probably. That was my intention or understanding or how you see it from that point of view that uh, mm -hmm. you bring the scientist later on in. So that's another like a great model. And then mm -hmm. I think you have the good relationship already, mm -hmm. understanding that conditions w on based on what you started to build. Mm. Yeah, and then of course, Vitaly, you yourself are, are sort of a living example that you've been for first working for these very successful, uh, maybe more software-driven companies, and now uh, becoming an entrepreneur and uh, in, in this deep tech space. Obviously, you're still sort of, uh, I, I guess that your, your solution doesn't include any, any hardware, but, uh, no, no, but no, still, no. Um, w what's your own observations, and do you, you, do you think that sort of your, your networks in, in these uh, wise times and, uh, and, and, and these sort of successful uh -huh. software-driven companies could be more, more, more helpful in, 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 in this oh, deep tech space. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can even share the story, you know. Uh, uh, so I guess uh, I can say that, you know, we've been uh, raising money uh, recently and uh, it turned out, uh, surprisingly, that my network in WISE really helped a lot because uh, you know, I built very good relationships with amazing people in WISE. And it turned out you know, uh, many of them, I, I managed to, let's say, convince them or you know, talk to them over the dinner, uh, just you know, invite to the dinner, talk about our company. And uh, many of them invested into mm. our company as angel investors. And exactly. uh, uh, I would say, like, I can probably maybe count on my fingers, but yeah, like, there have been uh, quite a few uh, mm. who invested. It was a big surprise to me, yeah. but it again shows that the world is small. And uh, yeah, 
uh, when you work in some company, uh, never be an asshole. Build good relationships <laughs> with people because it might turn out that uh, it might really, really help you later on. And not only, of course, uh, because of money, but also because, first of all, you might have very good friends later on. But it might be that those people will invest into you. And trust me, if, if you ask a person to invest, let's say, 25K as an angel investment ticket into your company, they won't invest uh, if they don't trust you. So, exactly. Yeah. Um, maybe th then a question related to sort of um, sort of understanding that there is a sort of the technical resources and, 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 and top talent is a scare resource and, uh, and, and there's a huge rivalry over, over the best talent. Um, what are your opinions? What deep tech companies can and could offer uh, for this talent to be motivated to work for, for, for the businesses? Maybe Vitaly, if you'd like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I think, um, let's say, I have some opinions for that. So first, I think, um, I think contributing to open source is important uh, in a sense that it doesn't mean you have to open source your competitive advantage or something, mm. but you can open source some general tooling that you build that are useful for you. Like good example, I think, in the industry is Netflix, uh, Spotify, who build a lot of open source tooling, and people know that, and people know also they build amazing engineering blogs where they share a lot of cool information. And this is, I would say, this is how to say it's like content marketing, mm -hmm. but it's not, uh, how to say, a C a SEO, a S SEO optimized content marketing, right? right? It's a value, high value based content marketing. Uh, and this is, I think, very powerful because then people start to realize, oh, you're kind of, you're at the front fr uh, forefront of your field, you're sharing mm -hmm. the knowledge, you're, also it's very important to engage in the community. So I'll give an example, yesterday I, talked with uh, one of the main guys uh, who builds uh, medical imaging in a AWS, uh, Chris Heffy, and it turns out that he, um, he has uh, weekly uh, community meetings with medical imaging experts. Mm. So I think to be involved in your community with experts in your field is very important uh, because then you're not in your bubble and you actually learn from others what's happening. Uh, contributing with open source, uh, having a blog and really providing value in that and uh, in my opinion, important thing to attract uh, top talent is to be very transparent with uh, your uh, package, uh, mm -hmm. compensation package. In our company, we are very transparent with the options package you get. And we even, for example, um, how to say, uh, we, given all the future delusions, we kind of predict it as much as we can. Uh, what would be, let's say, your upside if the company gets 100 million valuation or billion valuation? Of course, all the numbers are, how to say, uh, very, it's a guesswork. Um, but I think there are actually online, uh, good online websites to do this kind of modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, and we show all of these in the Excel sheet. Uh, so I, in my opinion, it's very important to be very transparent with the options package. Because if you just say to a person, hey, you have 500 options or 1,000, but this number doesn't mean anything in the context you don't share percentages, uh, that, that won't cut, that won't fly. Exactly. Yeah. Anything to add, Mart? Yeah, I think I quite echo echoing the, the purpose. I think this is really the primary part. What is the mission? What I really believe, and what we come together, and what we can achieve together, and that's part. And also, I think being uh, not so like the capitalist from the point of view. I think mm. not maximizing return of investment only. I think really playing it right for the balance of the yes, we all should have a better future, but but it's not the purpose why to come together. I think this is another like uh, like the mindset shift. I think we believe also as Estonia is quite like the young capitalist country, we could say so, that that's only one way it is, but I think really balancing the, mm -hmm. the purpose versus the nice uh, return, uh, mm -hmm. which is which is like, should be okay, but, but I think not maximizing it. So so I think this is the culture altogether, I think, which comes people together. Exactly. Yeah, I, I fully sort of subscribe into this uh, this purpose purpose theme. Um, what we see in our portfolio companies that, uh, especially the younger generations, but, but also the, the, the more sort of more older ones are nowadays sort of really getting motivated out of working for something meaningful. And, uh, and, and that's also one of the reasons why we think that our portfolio companies who are trying to sort of overcome these significant challenges are, are in a sort of positions where, positioned very well in this, in this uh, uh, competition over, over talent. Mm -hmm. Because people want to change the world maybe rather than, than just uh, have the next sort of digital gadget or, or, or what have you. Yeah. And, uh, and talents attracts talents. Yeah. <laughs> that's also, I know, if you get going, I think you will get going. So I think that's another like what I have seen quite, quite, quite a lot. So 
great bright minds would like to work with other other similar ones. So mm -hmm. I think if we already get going, so this is this is like a good foundation that needs to be there. Definitely. Um, any questions on on the team building side from the audience? All right. So um, um, oh. Maybe I wanted to ask Marta. Remember, you see from your slides, you said that um, science-based companies tend to have very homogeneous teams. Is this sort of what you see too in the university side? Uh, rather, yes, yes. I think, uh, and that's there is good reasons why it is as it is. So, so and but I, I also have seen in my previous jobs that uh, how this diversity pays back radically, radically. Well, uh, it takes time and, and it's not easy to start, but later on, I think, really to, to bring those examples and, and, and the case studies and stories to tell and, and inspire people to be more open for different, non-professional even, I think, but really having the broad perspectives coming together and respecting people as they are, I think this is absolutely critical for the success and also for the, for the growth that even you are so similar one at the beginning, but when you start to scale, I think there is, you're running out of the similar people one on one. So I think it means that you have to be more open for different cultures and different backgrounds and so on. I think this is another way, also the kind of culture aspect is, but yeah, I, I agree. This is one of the challenges, definitely. Perfect. Um, then I, I, I would suggest that we move to the sort of last topic of, of, of the panel and uh, really sort of uh, tapping into the requirements for building a deep tech ecosystem and, and also then, then sort of uh, uh, coming, uh, coming to this regional level questions, how, how we could play it right uh, between Estonia and Finland. But maybe to start off uh, with uh, Mart, from your perspective, what are the uh, main bottlenecks uh, for expanding the deep tech ecosystem, and uh, what are the what different stakeholders could do in order to improve that? Yeah, I think this definitely topic <laughs> requires a specialist like the conference <laughs> to be covered. But I think I I see this kind of critical mass definitely. I think as as we have the small a small region, uh, Nordic Baltics, I think. Um, uh, we uh, don't have that deal flow uh, from, from the business point of view, so that we can build separate chapters that we build our own boutique here and second one there and third one there. So having this like a really collaborative mindset mm -hmm. and then and, and long run, I think there is some of the good advice I've said about that. You want to have like the 100% 100, 100 of the problem or 10% or of success. So I think this is another part of it, the sharing mindset that we can learn from each other. So I, I believe that we have to, first of all, uh, universities definitely first question that we have to be aligned from that point of view that what is the role of the universities? Uh, what is its third mission that we, we are serving? And I think we are evolving, but it's not so clear yet. This is the part of it. And, and second, the uh, bottleneck, I, I believe, is that uh, I believe the tech development uh, funding and, and, and I think one of the value that also we can put table is kind of different grants and matching the investor, investor capital with the grant fundings. Uh, but I think what I have seen that uh, these grants uh, in the early stage are, are more technology focused. So there is not the capability to build the business development side. Mm -hmm. And that's putting unbalanced already the, the development and we're progressing the company. So you are you're quite advanced with the TRL and, and so on, but you don't have any clue about the business and the market and so on. This is definitely one of the, the mm -hmm. bottlenecks of what I see that early phase uh, business development uh, and there is uh, for that capital, it's um, unresponsible to give the return of investment promise. Mm. So it's really high risk and I think it, it might go right, but I think it's not about investment yet. So mm. having to really pre-seed pre uh, business development uh, funding, I, I believe this is definitely one of the parts that we should have it. And having access to the best advisors, uh, mm. that's the last part of it, but I see really critical that, that we, we, there is the motivation, the logic why you get access to the, to the great advisors and, and supporters for you as ecosystem part of it. Mm. So, so I, I think this is maybe the, the three, three main, uh, main aspects that needs to be played right and then we can start to scale uh, more, more systematically. Mm. Good. Uh, th then Vitaly, maybe one from your perspective, what do you see um, are, are the sort of elements or aspects which would help you to grow your company faster and boost the 
probably also the ecosystem that you would like to sort of uh, get get support of more support or help or or advice yeah that's a very good question i think um totally agree on advisors you have to surround yourself with good advisors but the build ecosystem and uh, you know we we are in the medical imaging space and um it's a it's really it's it's really a tough question in a sense because there are not many medical imaging you know startups in estonia per se uh, maybe in finland there are more i don't know uh but definitely i i see there are a few aspects like first you have to as i said about communities you you have to i believe you uh, if you're let's say even a Estonian company you have to have a discourse uh in in a very good international community in your space so especially in deep tech right because you're you have a deep expertise in something you cannot afford to be in the bubble so you have to uh, go internationally you have to you know talk to the best people in the field um and then uh, regarding the ecosystem in Estonia or um I don't I don't even um what was the question related also like how can we improve the ecosystem in Estonia? Yeah, or how can we improve or or what do you think that are would help you the most if if the sort of the ecosystem could provide you more more of something to you to mm-hmm. accelerate mm-hmm. your growth or make the sort of your journey smoother what mm-hmm. what kind mm-hmm. of elements you would like to see? Mhm. Mm-hmm. No, definitely selecting your advisors and investors is very important. Mm-hmm. Uh that's number one. Um number two, like you know, I was coming from fintech or like this you know, more, more classical software engineering side and it's easy to find tech conferences there or conferences related to like you know fintech for example, mm-hmm. not that hard, but when it comes to some you know deep tech related or in my case medical imaging related, mm-hmm. there're not so many conferences in uh, Estonia and Finland related to that. Uh so I think uh let's say I guess it's also part of our responsibility to to somehow, you know, find like-minded people or or if people in the same industry mm. and somehow talk to each other, meet yeah. each other and I think uh, yeah, I think it's very important. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's basically like having the critical mass of companies and uh, and, and supporting yeah. each other and and building sort of yeah. the community. Yeah. It's c- kind of like in Germany there is a critical mass of fintech companies yeah. and now you know people who left one fintech company create uh, two more <laughs> or something so there they have a yeah. really a, in berlin is full of fintech companies yeah. so. uh, i i i agree all yeah. of that and and maybe this also sort of again comes down to this sort of talent attraction and uh, mm-hmm. how to get the best talent to sort of join local companies or even establish the companies uh, here in, in in estonia or in finland and uh, and 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 that way build the sort of um, Uh, local ecosystem to be to be stronger um i i i think sort of the societies uh, in, in in both countries have a lot of sort of these uh, positive elements uh which many many foreign people sort of uh value but i i think that there's a lot of un- unused potential also for that related to education and uh, sort of uh, overall sort of uh, uh sentiment in in the in the society and uh, and uh, sort of nature and, and and all kinds of things and uh, we don't have too hot summers uh, which for Finnish people sounds a bit p- pretty stupid but when you have been in a, in a, in a 30 40 degrees of celsius uh, heat in several months I, i think you start sort of valuing that as as well yeah you see may I ask you though like what's your opinion on how we can uh improve our ecosystem like either in Estonia or Finland and yeah uh, uh, of course if if uh, I, i think i don't have a sort of silver bullet for that that neither but uh, as, as mentioned I, i think the talent attraction is the most sort of mm-hmm. uh, important thing um maybe speaking more of the finnish perspective there's also a lot of bureaucracy related to foreign people uh, to move to finland and uh, and work for uh, for finnish startups or or finnish companies uh that's something that the global sort of this ecosystem both the Finnish Finnish uh, venture capital association but also the Finnish startup community community have been driving really sort of uh strongly that the bureaucracy related to uh, foreign people to come in Finland and and work work for Finnish companies must be sort of uh, uh much more easy and uh, it might even for in Finland it might take several months before you can have a bank account if you if you're for foreign people moving to Finland so i i think that is the, the first bottleneck um 
Then maybe uh, the, the other part, which is also maybe the final final topic of, of our, our question, is, is really how to maybe deepen the collaboration between Finland and and, uh, and, and Estonia, and basically like uh, Helsinki and Tallinn are so so close to each other. It's it's more or less the almost the same region. So I don't know. Do you have any any sort of uh, comments on that? Yeah, I, I believe this is great potential, and also I think the, the Stockholm is not far away, and I think mm. we have a good already, already ongoing relationship. So and and bit of the similar business culture. Mm. I think I, this, this 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 definitely I really believe that uh, that we are living on the base on similar values uh, in that that region, and then I think it's easy to build trust. But I, I think maybe the the only way to not kind of like building the perfect. Uh, uh, policy or, or, or so on, I think it's we should be more iterative mm -hmm. <laughs> to try and test and to learn. I think this is really uh, overall what we can do. And I believe this Estonia has been like a bit of this kind of like lab for uh, for uh, mm. what is the tomorrow's uh, Nordic tech, tech transfer model look like. So mm. I think we could really experiment and we can we can make the tests and we can build the learning based on back. So so and because I think this is a lot to learn from uh, from uh, from neighborhood. Uh, at the same time, I, I think we have the bit of luxury here in Estonia that uh, we don't have this whole legacy, mm. uh, how things are in the past. So that, as you're saying, this 25% universities will, that's kind of his, has been historically like the maybe 50 years. Mm. Uh, and it's really hard to change that mindset because there is new generation maybe not, not, has to come in. So, But we mm. don't have that rules. So I believe this ex Estonia could be one of experimental place for uh, for uh, building here more deep tech companies with the with the, with the faster, most transparent, uh, and more streamlined uh, tech transfer support systems. So mm. I, I think this definitely is the, is the great place. And also giving back for all of this. Because yeah. I think that having these investors, uh, advisors uh, surrounding the b bigger network, this is absolutely critical. So yeah. and then I think there has to be benefit for the both ends. So we can experiment, we can learn, we can make the failures. And also the, the neighbors can also benefit out from it. So this is, I think, we can build somehow together. Anything to add? Yeah, one more advice, I think, for early companies is, I mean, we were lucky enough to raise mostly in Estonia because, you know, Brit Saloma, CEO, and like I and some others, they, we have quite a good network of people who were willing to angel invest. Uh, uh, yeah, Super Angel was first one as well. And then, um, but I think uh, one way of maybe as well uh, kind of having more mingling in the region is mm. if you don't happen or don't find investors in Estonia, well, go to Finland. Go on a ferry and go to some conference and go to Finland or go to Stockholm and uh, get some investors there. And I think the magic will be that if you get investors there, they will have connections in their country, a lot of connections, and you will suddenly have a lot of mingling with you know, their country and there will be back and forth. Exactly. Yeah. And building some regular routines. I think you cannot fix it with the one event, one mm -hmm. trip to the, mm -hmm. uh, with the ferry. So, mm -hmm. but, but I think you're doing it often systematically, I think, and then you're starting to build up the understanding yep. what works. Yeah. Hey, uh, gentlemen, I, I thank you for, for your very uh, insightful and valuable comments and uh, good discussion. Uh, we're unfortunately running out of time, even though I, I guess that the discussion could continue a lot longer. Um, maybe just to briefly then, then sort of wrap up the, the discussion. So we first touched upon uh, the discussion about the tech transfer. Obviously, I, I guess the conclusion is that uh, there aren't a silver bullet for that, and uh, and uh, what we should maybe more, uh, be, be, uh, more try different kind of kinds of models, and and try to find a, a sort of sort of uh, ways to uh, have more startups to be uh, to be established from from the research, and uh, and uh, <clears throat> that would benefit both the universities, but also of course the society, and uh, then we move towards the sort of uh, team building part, and uh, and. Uh, I, I think everybody agrees that uh, more sort of uh, commercial talent, uh, marketing talent is needed in the early stage research-based companies. Uh, good practices are existing, investors are trying to help, but uh, there's also a lot of room to Im for improvement and, uh, and probably also room for, Im room for in increasing the collaboration between universities and maybe exchange notes and uh, that way sort of uh, uh, find the best practices. And, and then uh, the l last part was, was then about this, uh, uh, this collaboration uh, and, and building the ecosystem, collaboration between Nordic countries, Baltic countries, 
and the whole region. And uh, uh, I, I guess that the, again, there there are different different uh, uh, measures that can be taken, but uh, most likely more collaboration will 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 sort of uh, then result um, better results than 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 anything else. So uh, let's really really try to use our efforts to to have. Uh, ways to collaborate more and uh, and find uh, find ways where where smart people can meet each other and uh, and uh, exchange their views and, and ideas thanks all right hey thank, thank you thank you for 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 the panel and uh, I, I think is it Kadri who, who is then then sort of uh, taking over the stage <laughs> yeah well thank you guys and uh, I need to know you need to run um, and have some meetings coming up so I will let you go and we will do some final words with you see uh, in, in a few minutes uh, we are finished I will um, thanks. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you thanks thanks we have just um, two questions that uh, that uh, came maybe I'll sit down as well yeah uh, that came from uh, from the from the chat or from the from the YouTube chat. So I'll read to them, and then we can we can sum up the event. So Rasmus is asking, how do, how do you believe a company should prove traction or customer demand in cases where the industry itself has not yet been established, and where the potential customers are also for early uh, startups? Mm. Um, yeah, that's definitely a good good question. Um, but I I, I think. Even if the market doesn't exist, um, uh, but if you have a new in innovation, you need to somehow then believe that there is going to be a new market, and uh, and and then you need to be able to identify who could be the customers uh, uh, for for your for your innovation and or for your product, and. Um, of course, before you have the actual product, uh, there are steps in between. Uh, typically, there we call this this N NRE projects, so non-recurring engineering, uh, where a partner or a customer is is sort of committed to that project and and they are paying for uh, for the collaboration, at, and at the same time, the startup startup is is uh, developing uh, their their product and and probably also the IP. And later on, when the product is is more ready, maybe maybe that will be the first customer. They they might then get sort of uh, some benefits of of supporting the the, the startup from early on, um, maybe exclusivities or something. But uh, uh, that, that that is obviously one way to to uh, try to find sort of uh, validation for in, in the early stages. Thank you. Uh, and the second question is, is from Madis, and he's asking uh, what further reading on the VC topic to suggest. Uh, Secrets of Sand Hill Road, Angel, Venture Deals have been read. Uh, maybe some blogs, LinkedIn or Twitter suggestions as well. So what are the things you uh, follow or read? Um, well, I, 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 I sort of generally speaking read a lot of uh, these sort of tech-related uh, 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 websites. Um, I don't. I, I by heart. I don't have any any book on my mind. Of course, there are plenty of good books related to BC, and of course, depending on what's the specific angle that you would like to understand more. Um, but uh, I, I, I know, of course, uh, just the following sort of uh, uh, like social media. The the for instance, we are we are providing Vomo Ventures is is. Uh, uh, constantly providing content. Also, we have founders who are who are writing blogs. We are, of course, ourselves writing blogs. We have other guest writers. So, I, I think many VCs are actually providing quite a lot of sort of interesting insights towards the industry. So that's, of course, maybe one source. Thank you. Uh, well, this wraps up the event. We are so very thankful for you uh, for preparing and for coming and for giving such an in-depth uh, overview. Of, of, of deep tech uh, fund uh, life and then how it's all going on. And then please feel free to reach out to, to you, mm -hmm. I, I guess. Um, sure. Uh, all, all here and, and, and then online too. So until our next event, thank you. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure for, for being here.